The following is a special presentation of ESPN on ABC. A picture-perfect day has dawned in America's heartland. Over this, the most famous track in the world, Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Today, for the 98th time, the greatest drivers in the world's fastest cars will risk everything to compete for the most coveted title in racing, winner of the Indianapolis 500. This has long been much more than a car race. This is where memories have been born and nurtured for generations. Mothers and fathers bringing their sons and daughters on the same pilgrimage they took years before. Hundreds of thousands will feel the action from these stands. They will see the heartbreak. And in the end, they will watch as one driver's life is changed forever. Hello from high above the racetrack where today, history will be made. I am Lindsay Zarniak, and I'm honored to welcome you as ESPN on ABC brings you the drama and the excitement of the Indianapolis 500 for the 50th straight year. There are compelling stories set to unfold. Among them, will Elio Castroneves become a four-time winner? Can NASCAR driver Kurt Busch surprise the field? Or will the Andretti curse finally be broken? But as always, the centerpiece of this show is the place. For a closer look at what makes this Speedway so special, we send it to Dr. Jerry Punch. Doc? Well, Lindsay, there are certain venues in sports that are just unmistakable. When you see a beautiful sunset over the San Gabriel Mountains, you're thinking Rose Bowl. The twin spires tell you it's got to be Churchill Downs. And if you get a glimpse of Amen Corner, there is no doubt you are at Augusta. But today, folks, I'm standing atop what many consider to be the most hallowed ground in all of motorsports, the legendary pagoda here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. From up here, I can see it all. The scoring pylon, the 33 cars that will compete, and how about this massive crowd of over 200,000 who will witness the largest single-day sporting event in the world. So let's take you from up here where you can see it all to down there where you can feel it. Here's Jamie Little. Well, Doc, I'm standing on Gasoline Alley. 33 drivers will walk through here believing today is their day. The day where they realize their hopes and dreams of drinking the milk and wearing the wreath and seeing their name and face etched on the Borg Warner Trophy. This is the pathway to broken hearts and immortality that is Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Rick DeBrule. Well, turn one here at Indy is one of the most spectacular and frightening places on earth. When the green flag falls, 11 rows of cars, three wide, will scream down this straightaway, all battling for the same piece of asphalt. Their goal to be as close as they can to that white line down there. A little high or a little low, they're not just going slow, they may be in danger. It's a moment when race fans around the world will hold their collective breath. And for the drivers, that's the moment when the race begins. Vince Welch. At the finish line, the yard of bricks is a symbol of both history and glory. This is the 98th year that the Indianapolis 500 has been contested. 749 men and women have accepted the challenge, and some have paid the ultimate price. The bricks are a reminder of all of those who have come before and a motivator for all those who will race today. For glory will come to the winner who at the end will be so thankful he'll get on his knees and kiss the bricks because this is Indianapolis. Thank you Vince. Each driver has his or her own story but they all want the same thing. They want to be the star of this race. Like an actor before a major performance these 33 racers and their teams have rehearsed all year learning their lines around this track focusing on their role in the production. Unlike the theater, there's no script. Only one thing is certain. Just one person gets the curtain call. All the world's a stage, but some stages, they are bigger than all the other stages in this world. My first memory uh, coming to the Speedway it was such a huge place. This is the biggest racetrack I've ever been. I feel the atmosphere of you know, 350,000 plus people. When you stand here in real life, uh, it is very impressive. And if you let it be, it could be intimidating as well. 
And all the men and women are merely players. All the names that have come here before us. Guys that you know, were and are my heroes. You know, Rick Mears, A.J. Foyt, Jim Clark. It's all over. A.J. has done it. Rick Mears, now a four-time winner of the 500. And one man, in his time, plays many parts. I played a role that uh, the nice guy that uh, led a lot of laps but never had won the race. Today, they don't call me Elio Cachoneva. They call me the three-time Indy 500 champ. You know, to, to jump to a, a, a multiple winner uh, for the Indianapolis 500 would be a dream come true for me. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. You're being judged. You know, everyone will say, well, you know, he did well, but he never won Indianapolis. Marco Andretti, Wallace wins! 37 years since an Andretti won at Indianapolis. So you start looking around and you realize there's a lot of people that come through here have never won it. Immortality in silver for eternity. To see my my likeness on the War Corner trophy, for me it was a very special moment. You have your face on that trophy and, and you know and then to get it on there more than once, it's just uh, I don't know, it's hard to explain. I'm the latest face there. It's a dream come true. So long lives this and gives life to thee. Take whatever you've ever done in your lifetime that's, that's you've been the most excited about or the happiest about or whatever, and just to kind of triple or quadruple it, and, and that's when it didn't happen. You can see I raised my visor and I was actually wiping my eyes because I couldn't, I couldn't see the track. I was crying so much. This race is so special, and when you win it, then that whole addiction to trying to win it again becomes all-consuming. And I'm telling you, it is magical. The stage, the players, the crowd, the set, the lights, the role of a lifetime. They're all in place on this, the biggest stage. This, 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 this is Indy. The month of May is much more than the Indy 500. It is a celebration leading up to the race. You see the Indy Grand Prix was run this year, big concerts, the world's second largest parade head downtown. The big parade that no one misses. Drivers holding autograph sessions. Really an opportunity to fans to get so close to their favorite drivers. A huge concert. One of country's biggest stars, Jason Aldean performing. And a football star earlier today. There's Andrew Luck, the Colts quarterback handing over the green flag to Mark Cuban there, Dallas Mavericks owner, Indiana grad, both very exciting gentlemen. And the tradition of the milk delivery is one of many that ABC has been honored to bring you for the last 50 years. The milk that was brought in this morning here that will be presented to the winner of the Indy 500. And as we celebrate that anniversary of 50 years on ABC, there is one among us who today marks almost half of that amount of years. Doc, I know that this is a special day for you. Lindsay, this is truly a landmark day in sports television. You know, folks, you know, I've personally had the privilege of being a part of our coverage of this great spectacle for the past 23 years. And during that time, I've seen my share of triumphs and tragedy here. On the one hand, the race itself has showcased some of IndyCar's greatest drivers. And on the other, the ABC production has involved some of the true legends in sports television. Here is our look back at 50 years of indie memories on ABC. This is the biggest single sporting event on earth. I don't care who you are, where you've been, what you've seen, you would have goose papers. It's about hundreds of thousands of people who gather together to share this experience live and millions of people who are sharing it on television. Ready, 23, take. You have a responsibility to history. It's important that you get it right. And one, fade up. This is ABC's Wide World of Sports. This may be the day that a revolution is completely and successfully concluded. And the race is on. 50 years of moments, 50 years of memories. This race, in my view, lives most on its legacy, its traditions. There are so many that it's almost impossible to drink it all in. 
Understanding the enormity of this race and this place means knowing when to let the story tell itself. And Scott Goodyear is now right there, right behind little Al. Al Unser Jr. Scott Goodyear, it's the closest ever. And we kept thinking, gosh, I hope it stays good like this. Scott Goodyear closes in. He looks for a place to come by. Scott Goodyear tries it, but no. And I looked past the monitor and looked right down on the racetrack to see where did little Al finish. That was the most fabulous finish I've ever seen. I mean, it was so close. Bobby, your brother. Alonser joins A.J. Foyt as one of only two men ever to win the Indianapolis 500 four times. I can't help it. I started crying. I just want you to know, the family's proud of you. That was neat. It was a bit embarrassing for me. It's, I guess, it's one of the few times that I wasn't really ready for things. Good afternoon. I'm Jim McKay speaking to you from one of the most exciting spots at one of the most exciting moments in all the wide world of sport. And there's an actor in the front trailer. Where's Point? I don't know whether he can get through or not. He had a voice that kind of grabbed you. There he is. He was making a call just like I was feeling in the cockpit of the race car. Am I going to make it through or am I not? AJ Point will win the flag is out again. Oh, and there's Mario Andretti's car. Yes, Mario. Yep. 71. ABC hired me as a stooge to stand in uh, turn four. Mario Andretti spun, and I was thinking to myself, oh, God, don't come anywhere near me. Mario, what happened? He doesn't know that I don't know what I'm doing. What about the traffic? The faster car is coming up to the slower ones now. Well, that's uh, normal. The uh, pace of the race, I mean, this is the everywhere. Thank you very much, Mario Andretti. And then he walked off. I was on cloud nine for the for the rest of the summer because I thought, oh my gosh, I've been on network television. And push does our five. Welcome to Indianapolis. I'm Paul Page. And I, I am who I am because of the Indianapolis 500. What a day it has been. A day of events and surprises. It's not just presenting an event. He hits the wall, coming out of four. Telling a story is what a broadcast is about. The Indy 500 was here before us, and it will be here long after we're gone. He's gonna win at the strike. One visit is moving. 50 is transforming. Bobby Unser won this race three times. He went on then to work as a broadcaster for ABC for 11 years. Bobby, thank you for joining us. And we just saw you when you were watching your brother win his fourth Indy 500. Why did that make you someone who's won three times here so emotional? Well, first place, you gotta remember that, that I have to be totally independent when I did television. I can't show that I'm favoring my brother or my nephew. But when that happened, ah, come on, that's really trying and it passed what I was expected to do. So I got a little tear in my eyes here, you know? What was it like for you making that transition from driving and running in this race to being up in the booth? Took me a long time to get used to it, but it was probably, I bet you it was harder for me doing the booth than it was doing the race. What are you talking about? A lot of pressure. You're on live television. It's going all over the world. Wait a minute. You're it's saying that's, big deal. that's more pressure than starting the Indy 500. I did that for a lot of years. I was kind of used to that. This, so that can become old hat. For sure. You know, that's the greatest event in the world. So <laughs> naturally, it kind of ties me up. And Bobby, you're going to be watching the greatest event in the world from where? I'll go around different places. I'll go up Mary George's suite for a little while. Then I go down in my motor home for a while watching on ABC like I used to do. Bobby Unser, thank you so much for joining us. Thank Truly a me. legend in the sport. So from a legend, we're taking out of some current stars. We've got the drivers that are preparing to walk from Gasoline Alley to their race cars here. Elio Castroneves, he's got his family in tow going for that fourth Indy 500 win today. 
the target drivers. Tony Kanaan on the left there told me this week, I never even knew if I'd be racing this year because he didn't know he would have a ride until he won the Indy 500. Simon Pagano, he's actually the last driver to win on this racetrack, won the Grand Prix back on May 10th. These drivers all hoping to have their face added to the prestigious Borg Warner Trophy, which is always a work in progress. Once the milk is wiped away, the winner's face becomes the canvas for sculptor William Barrett. I'm trying to bring out uh, what I feel their personality or the, the best qualities of their, of their image are. From clay, a likeness emerges that is cast in sterling silver for a trophy that embodies the immortality of the Indianapolis. You have 100 faces on there. It really is the history of the Indy 500 in one object. Okay, so you might not have been able to read Tony's chicken scratch there on that trophy, but he thanked the artist for not messing up his nose. Andretti Autosports with five cars entered in today's race, all drivers with great stories. Marco Andretti, of course, trying to become the first in his family to win this race since 1969 when his grandfather Mario did it. Carlos Munoz there walking beside him. He came in second last year, a big star. How about this guy, Kurt Busch, running in this race this morning, his first time here at Indy, and then flying to Charlotte to run in the NASCAR race tonight. Talk about double duty. All these guys looking for their first win in the Indy 500. Now some other notables trying for that elusive first victory. Local sensation, Ed Carpenter, starts from the pole for a second year in a row. One of only five drivers with double digits starting at Indy. Graham Rahal hoping to silence critics in his seventh attempt. He's crashed out in three of his six attempts. Certainly, these drivers can look at what Tony Kanaan did last year, though, as serious inspiration because it took him 12 years to get that first win. So it's going to be hard to top the emotion that everybody felt when Tony Kanaan finally won this race for the first time. His fun-loving personality has really made him a fan favorite, but it was a lucky charm from one fan in particular that helped him win this race. That's what he says. Years ago, Tony gave her the gift of hope. And as Chris Connolly tells us, that gift came back to him in the most valuable way he could have ever imagined. From the beginning, Tony Kanaan never started a race without... My mom gave it to me when I was a little kid, and I would wear it every time, every race, to protect me. And as I grew up, it didn't fit on my neck anymore, so I just actually rolled it up and put it in my pocket. By 2004, Kanaan was already a racing star, preparing for his third Indy 500, when he visited nearby Methodist Hospital. There, a mother sat at the bedside of her teenage daughter. Three days earlier, 15-year-old Andrea Brown had collapsed in her room after a softball doubleheader. Doctors had provided a grim diagnosis. She's had a massive brain hemorrhage, and her chances are not good. You know, you're thinking, I'm calling for last rites for my 15-year-old. Andrea was in a medically induced coma with critical brain surgery set for the following day. But Tony Kanaan entered her room. I felt really bad, really bad. And, and I felt sorry for the mother. He was very personable, very warm. And I do remember he said, you know, I'll pray for him. As he spoke, he reached for the medallion in his pocket. And I said to her mom, you're a mother, you know how much you care about your daughter. My mom gave me this medal to protect me. So if you believe this, I'm gonna give it to you. We usually kept it pinned to Andrea's when she was in room, but when she went to surgery, then I wouldn't wear it. It brought good luck, it kept him safe. It keep Andrea safe too. As Andrea recovered and sought to find her way back to her old self, the medallion was a talisman of hope around her neck. I just felt, you know, extremely special that, you know, I, I had this medallion that, you know, he personally gave to me. 
Andrea would achieve her dreams, graduating college, becoming a physical therapist, getting married. But winning the 500 was Tony's dream, and he kept falling short. Oh, the heartbreak for the 11. Tony Kanaan lost it, got a pie at the it's bar. It's all but eliminated his chances of winning this race. The Indy 500 was extremely heartbreaking through the years. He would be such a popular champion. There was always some kind of bad luck that would happen, you know? So, two days before Indy 2013, Andrea put something special in an envelope for Tony and wrote him this letter. I'm probably gonna cry, but she says, nine years ago. You gave me your good luck charm, and obviously it has done more than just help me have a remarkable recovery from my brain hemorrhage. I'm sure good luck charm has more luck to bring, and thus I would like you to have it back. And I can't wait to watch it dominate this race. May 26, 2013, Andrea and her family gathered to watch the 500, where Tony Kanaan's decade of bad luck ended at last. Look who's first, Tony Kanaan. After years of frustration. You're now a winner of the Indianapolis 500, my friend. Great job, Tony. Thank you. Thank you. I got a little bit of luck today. One of the first things he did was pull out that medallion. That was for her. To show her that I knew she was watching. We can still see and feel the emotion between these two. Tony Kanaan and Andrea Irwin reunited here at the Speedway. And Andrea, when you saw Tony win that race a year ago and standing in victory lane and hold up that medallion, what was that moment like for you? It was amazing. I we were jumping up for joy, crying, hugging each other. It was a wonderful, wonderful time to enjoy. It was amazing. Tony, a lot of work, a lot of challenges that lie ahead. You're about to run another Indianapolis 500, and this young lady is about to have her first child. What's next for the Lucky Charm? Uh, we retired the Lucky Charm. We're going to probably, uh, we decided that, you know, it, it's not worth it to take it another 500. Uh, eventually, it's going to make history for somebody else. We're going to find somebody that is in need of something someday, and we're going to give it back. Hey, good luck today. Thank you. What an amazing story of human triumph. A tiny medallion that worked its magic in both the intensive care and the Indianapolis 500. Lindsay? Thanks, Doc. Tony did joke he's not going to give it to anyone else on the grid, so don't worry. Uh, he now, though, has a target on his back figuratively and literally as the defending champ, also as a new member of Target Ganassi Racing, but that's bittersweet for Tony, taking over the seat left open by his best friend, Dario Franchitti, who suffered a career-ending crash in Houston last October. Franchitti preparing to spend his first Indy 500 as a mentor rather than a competitor, and he's standing by with our Vince Welch. Vince? Ten times a racer here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, three times a winner, but no more for one of the sports legends, Dario Franchitti. What's the emotions, Dario, of being here? It's weird seeing you in your civvies, by the way, being here and not being able to race. It's a little weird right now. This is a, a time when I'm normally focused and ready to go, like these guys behind me, but I'm enjoying soaking up the atmosphere today. I'm lucky to be here, and I'm really enjoying just being here at Indianapolis and um, getting ready to watch these boys go racing, and hopefully we can get one of the target cars in victory lane today. After the career-ending accident and the injury, um, what, how has that affected your perspective of what these guys are doing out here in the race car now that you're viewing it as a spectator? I used to think what I did as a driver was normal. What these guys do every day as drivers is normal. It's not normal. And uh, I've got so much more respect for what they did and, and what they do and you know what, what I was able to do on occasion now that I've stepped back from it. These guys, these girls are so brave and so talented and uh, it's a pleasure to watch them. Um, I wish I was still out there, but I'm not. So uh, I'm going to do enjoy uh, every moment of being out of the car and um, and get to do what I do. We wish you were out there too. Thanks Dario for the time. Dario Franchitti, of course some call it crazy, some call it bravery, but uh, in the face of danger, the real racer just mashes the gas. They are different from you and me. Faster. 
memory. One perfect and fleeting moment. Which tastes like milk. Yes, it takes a certain uniqueness to get behind the wheel out on the track today. And this guy has it, Ed Carpenter, your pole sitter for the second year in a row. He's it is a glorious day here at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. The fans have packed in hundreds of thousands here to watch the Indy 500. And we are less than an hour away from the green flag signaling the start of the 98th running of this race. Teams making the final preps, going through their mental checklist to get ready for 200 laps of Big time racing, there have only been three four-time champs in the history of the Indy 500. A.J. Foyt, Al Unser, Rick Mears, you see them there, while six drivers have won the race three times. One of those drivers is Mr. Personality himself, Elio Castroneves, who has a unique relationship with the fans and the fence that protects them. I'm 2.5 miles of weaved metal wire. I am the fence, protector of the spectacle. Oh, we got a crash! Oh, wicked crash! A towering wall, strong, unconquerable. I am the. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Wait a minute. You know, I I conquered you. I climbed you. I kind of made you a little famous. You know, so um. This one is going to be for Elio. The fans and I already understand each other what to do. I kind of respect the fans. The fans respect me. And that's a good way to have it. <laughs> The reason that I climbed the fence, I guess, um, it's a way of expression. And normally in Brazil, when the people express themselves, especially in soccer, they go and join with the fans. My first time, I just want to express myself and say, yeah, I want to race. I look at my left, I saw the fans, and I saw actually the crowd going crazy, and I said, you know what? I'm going to go and celebrate with them. You know, with all this climb the fence, they call me the Spider-Man. People ask me, well, who is better looking, if it's Peter Parker or, or myself? Of course myself, you kidding me? <laughs> Elio Castro Nevis has won the Indianapolis 500. The first time I climbed the fence in Indianapolis, I hear the crowd going crazy, and having your entire team sharing that special moment. The whole Penske crew is getting up on the fence. I don't think the Indianapolis Motor Speedway has ever seen anything like this. I want them to uh, feel uh, as much as important as I feel. What do I do winning four Indy 500? Wow, I'm all about tradition, so I'm not planning to do anything different. If it's working, don't change. 
imagine how crazy this place would be if he climbed this fence for the fourth time today? Those soccer players who inspired Elio's climb will be in action in the sports ultimate showcase as the World Cup from Brazil starts June 12th on ESPN. And here you see Spider-Man himself hugging his daughter. He's got the headphones on. He's in the mood, getting ready for the race. Elio among the field of 33 right now for the driver introductions. We send it over to Dave Calabro. Ladies and gentlemen, the moment we've been waiting for, here we go. Let's meet the starting lineup for the Indianapolis 500, the greatest spectacle in racing. Starting on the outside of row 11, from Vail, Colorado, the 1996 champion, Buddy Lazier. In the middle of row 11, the pole winner for the inaugural Grand Prix of Indianapolis, Sebastian Saavedra. On the inside of row 11, the first of our seven rookies, the reigning Indy Lights champion, Sage Cara. <laughs> outside of row 10, the 2012 pole winner from Australia, Ryan Briscoe. In the middle of row 10, one of our four starters from England, Martin Plowman. On the inside of row 10, another rookie driver, James Davison. Outside row 9, after a 19-year absence from this race, welcome back the 1995 champion, Jacques Villeneuve. Starting in the middle of row 9, making his fourth 500 start is Charlie Kimball. And on the inside of row number nine, making his eighth appearance in the 500 from California, Townsend Bell. Let's move to row number eight. Starting outside, former pole winner in Indianapolis from Canada, Alex Tagliani. In the middle of row eight, driving for the legend AJ Foyt from Japan, Takuma Sato. On the inside, the only woman in this year's race, making her third start from England, welcome Pippa Man. Row seven, starting on the outside from Colombia, it's Carlos Huertes. In the middle of row seven, the son of the 86 champion Bobby Rahal from Ohio, it's Graham Rahal. In the middle of row seven, the 2012 Verizon IndyCar Series champion from Florida, Ryan hunter Ray. We move to row six, starting on the outside for Team Rahal Letterman Landing and Racing, Oriol, Serbia. In the middle of row six from Le Mans, France, welcome Sebastian Bourdais. And on the inside of row number six, the defending Indianapolis 500 champion from Brazil, TK Tony Khan. <laughs> row five on the outside, the first Russian driver to race in the 500 from Moscow. Please welcome Mikhail Alosha. The middle of row five, a member of the British delegation driving for Dale Coyne Racing, here's Justin Wilson. On the inside of row five, another British driver. Please welcome rookie Jack Hawksworth. Row four, starting on the outside. He plans to run an extra 600 miles today. An Indy 500 rookie, but a veteran NASCAR driver, here's Kurt Busch. In the middle of row four, the 2008 500 winner, three-time IndyCar champion, Scott Dixon. On the inside of row four, returning to the 500 for the first time since winning this race 14 years ago, welcome back, Juan Pablo Montoya. Starting on the outside of row number three, the driver who came all so close to winning it three years ago from California, J.R. Hildebrand. 
In the middle of row three, a former Freedom 100 winner from Tennessee, driving for Sarah Fisher Hartman Racing, Joseph Newgarden. On the inside of row three, last year's Indy 500 runner-up, driving for Andretti Autosport, Carlos Munoz. Now to row number two, on the outside, making his ninth start from Nazareth, Pennsylvania. Please welcome Marco Andretti. The middle of row two, the winner of the inaugural Grand Prix of Indianapolis from France, Simon Pagano. On the inside of row number two, a three-time Indy 500 champion from Brazil, it's Elio Castaneda. And now race fans, the front row. On the outside, making his seventh start in the 500 from Team Penske, the current IndyCar points leader, Will Power. In the middle of row number one, driving for Andretti Autosport, they call him the Mayor of Hinchtown. From Canada, it's James Hinchcliffe. And finally, for the second consecutive year, our pole sitter, Indy's very own, the Butler Bulldog, Ed Carpenter. <laughs> Race fans, your starting lineup from the 98th running of the Indianapolis 500 mile race. Let's give them a round of applause. You know, these drivers feel the pressure. They understand the opportunity, but they also, as James Hinchcliffe told us earlier this week, they feel relief when they get this photo op done, when they're able to go get ready to actually start those engines, because for a month, they have been thinking about nothing else than the Indy 500. They have been around the racetrack. It has consumed them. So finally, they are on the verge of being able to get this race underway and find out if they may be the one that ends up drinking the milk at the end of this race. Ed Carpenter knows the nerves that go along with that. Right now, he's standing by with our Vince Welch. This race is special for everyone involved, all 33 drivers, but for this man, he's been here as a kid. His family has owned, uh, has owned this racetrack his entire life. He's an integral part of the Indianapolis community. What does this day, Ed, mean to you? Uh, I mean, I love, I love race day here, you know, just hoping and praying that, that today is our day. You know, it's, it's what we prepare for all year is this race and uh, hopefully go out and get the job done. From 10th, uh, finished 10th place a year ago after starting from the pole. What has to be better from your team today to go from the pole to victory lane? Just have to make the right calls. You know, we've, we've got to be, you know, as flawless as anyone can be for 500 miles of field so competitive. Uh, that's my mindset is just trying to be perfect. The hometown favorite, Ed Carpenter, from the pole today in the 98th running of the Indianapolis 500. Rick? Well, Juan Pablo Montoya has driven on a lot of tracks and a lot of race cars, but he's only driven the Indy 500 once back in 2000, but that's all it took to become a winner. Now, you've changed a lot since then. That was 14 years ago, but how are you different as a driver today than when you won here? Well, I think I'm a lot more experienced, a lot more mature. I think, you know, being here with Tim Pesker and, you know, the Verizon car, I think it's really exciting. I think I got a really good shot at it. Uh, you know, it's probably eight or ten cars that are going to be really close together. So I think it's going to come down to, you know, who, whoever does the best, best job as a complete team. All right. You qualify with the second fastest time. But because you couldn't do it on Sunday during the fast nine, you're starting back in the fourth row. Does it give you confidence knowing your car is that fast? Our car was really good in qualifying. And, you know, we kind of messed up Saturday, so we learned a lesson. Um, I felt Monday I wasn't that happy with it. But in carburation day, we made some changes, and I was... I was really happy. We'll see now with the harder race track how he behaves. Right. How special is the Indy 500 to Juan Pablo Montoya? Check out what he brought out with him, a little camera. He's been taking pictures the entire time. Even a former winner wants to record his next trip here.
and Kurt Busch, the 2004 NASCAR champion, not only embarking on his first ever Indy 500, but your first Indy car race today, Kurt. What will be your biggest challenge? Just settling in and getting into that race mode. And race mode to me means protecting your car and putting yourself in uh, positions to make passes, but not um, questionable positions. And then uh, pit road. Pit road here is one of the toughest in a stock car. It's very tough with an Indy car. A lot of uh, execution today. The guy that makes the least amount of mistakes usually ends up close to the front in this race. It's not sometimes the fastest car. And just gotta thank Andretti Autosport, all these guys that have worked all month to make this happen. Uh, shout out to Tony Stewart and Gene Haas. Thank you guys. This 1100 miles starts right now and I've got to survive turn one and settle in. Best of luck to you. And he has to leave this racetrack by 4 p.m. today to make it to Charlotte. Lindsay? Could be a close call, Jamie. When we come back, we will have the annual Memorial Day tribute at the, at the track as you see the servicemen and women there now walking down along pit lane, just one of the many time-honored traditions of the Indy 500. Traditions are about familiarity, connecting with memories of the past. As we revel in the present, it's a glimpse of the bricks, a song that echoes off the grandstand, and the sweet taste of milk. Traditions allow us to remember, to slow down, even here, in the fastest place we know. We remember. are the stars here, but you would never know it from this scene. Some real heroes, servicemen and women aboard Chevrolet Silverados for the Chevy Military Lap, part of Military Appreciation Service Month. For more information, go to chevysalutes.com. And in that spirit, here's Doc with Army General Frank J. Grass. It is our honor to be joined now by General Frank Grass, uh, who is the Chief of the National Guard Bureau and a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And General, what does this uh, Memorial Day celebration and remembrance here at Indianapolis mean to you and to the millions of men and women who have served in our armed forces? Jerry, this has been just a great weekend. Uh, the men and women that serve our nation, uh, we owe so much to them. And this is an opportunity to salute those that have fallen and paid the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom, but also for their families to show respect to show remembrance to their families that we will never forget them. Sir, thank you for your time, your service, and most importantly, your commitment to our freedom. Thank you, sir. Lindsay? Thanks, Doc. Country singer, pop singer, Leanne Rimes, Grammy Award winner. She's here today performing the national anthem, and you performed all over the world, really. You've done several pro sporting events, but where does this gig rank for you? It's um, it's pretty high up there. I mean, it really is. This is uh, this is insanity. So many people, so much energy here that it's hard not to absorb that energy right now. So I'm trying to like calm down a little bit, but it's it's you know it's very high energy, uh, high energy sport, and fans are awesome. So I'm excited. Speaking of calming down, you know we talk so much about the drivers. They've got their mental checklist that right. they go through to get themselves ready. What do you do? I mean, this is such a big performance. Oh for my you. gosh, um, I warm up. I have a you know I have a routine where I do like vocal warm-ups and uh, I try to just take some deep breaths and it's always kind of weird no, no one ever sees like how quickly they're moving me around and like how okay. it's, it's just kind of chaotic and so you have to you have to try to keep yourself centered amidst you know all the chaos <laughs> and hope that it goes well which of right. course we know with right. you it always does all right we got to let you go because we thank know you're you. getting ready to perform very soon Leanne Rimes thank you for thank joining you. us best of luck you. With voices like Leanne Rhyme singing our national anthem and the military presence at the Speedway, this is not a day just to enjoy a race, but a weekend filled with national pride. We remember those whose names are written on the walls of our sacred memorials and those whose names will never be known. Inside this tomb lie the remains of a soldier. His name is... Outside the tomb stands a sentry. His vigil is unending. They are connected by love of country, a sense of duty, a sacred code. For the soldier, there was no glory, no closure for his family. 
no welcome for him back home. For the century, there is no rest. He is there through every season, every second, rain or shine, whether he is watched or totally alone. Such is the bond between the unknown soldier and the guardian of his memory, unbreakable and forever. One gave his life and identity in the fight for freedom. The other took an oath to honor that fallen soul. The soldier's sacrifice will never be forgotten because the sentry will always stand guard at the tomb of the unknown. have a chance to go to Washington, D.C. and witness the changing of the guard in person, you should. I can tell you from personal experience, it is truly moving. We thank them for their service. We are less than 30 minutes away from the start of this race, so now we send the trackside for our invocation. That fallen soul. The soldier's sacrifice will never be forgotten because the sentry will always stand guard at the tomb of the unknown. Ladies and gentlemen, to issue today's invocation, please welcome Indianapolis Bishop Christopher Coy. Good and gracious God, we give praise to you for the blessing of this day and this wonderful weather. Can I hear an amen? Yeah. On this Memorial Day weekend, we remember and lift up our heartfelt gratitude for all the men and women of our armed forces who died in defense of our nation. We call to mind as well all the men and women who serve our country now. Keep those in harm's way safe and bring them home to their families healthy and well. Can I hear an amen? amen? We thank you for those who make this the 98th running of the greatest spectacle in racing possible. Mary Holman George, the entire Holman George family, and the folks of the Verizon Indy Car Series. May the drivers, their crews, the safety teams, the IMS safety patrols, the owners, and spectators be protected from all harm and participate in this race safe and sound. Can I hear an amen? amen. And now, Lord, this race will soon start. May it be a good race. May it be fast and tight. May the pit stops be quick and the track be quicker. May the roar of the 2.2 liter V6 twin turbocharged engines be constant. And may the best team win. And can I hear an amen? amen. God bless America and Godspeed.
gentlemen, please remain standing. Grammy Award-winning artist and star of the upcoming VH1 series, Leanne and Eddie, please welcome Leanne Rhyme. Oh, you say. their loved ones, talking to their teams for any final notes. And you at home can watch along with 12 of your favorite drivers through the Watch ESPN app. In addition to our ABC telecast, fans can also enjoy in-car coverage live on ESPN3. That's available through Watch ESPN. You can experience high-definition views from the front, rear sides of the car, plus go inside the cockpit. You can access Watch ESPN by downloading that Watch ESPN app by visiting watchespn.com. And so the stage, racing's greatest stage, is set with question marks. Can Tony Kanaan make it back-to-back -back wins? Will this be win number four for Elio Castroneves? Can Juan Pablo Montoya win once again in his second attempt? How about Kurt Busch? Can he make it a memorable transition from NASCAR to IndyCar? Or will it be Hoosier Ed Carpenter bringing it home for Indiana? As of right now, all that matters to these drivers is speed over a course where time stands still. The 1971 Indianapolis 500 Classic. Good afternoon. I'm Jim McKay speaking to you from one of the most exciting spots at one of the most exciting moments in all the wide world of sports. Indianapolis 500 Mile Classic. Good afternoon. I'm Jim McKay speaking to you from one of the most the most exciting moments in all the wide world of sports. Behind me, the cars are being wheeled onto the track. Imagine a place that transcends time, where the thrill of victory brings our heroes together. You think you can be leading? Well, I don't think you're ever going to beat the track, but uh, you got to show respect. Where racing legacies last forever. Can we see another four-time winner? It's a bit of a dream, to be honest. You know, I came here once, I won the race, so it was really exciting. Second time around, the chances of winning are pretty good. A place where the bounty is worth the blood. It was definitely the biggest achievement of my career. As a little kid, I always wish I could make it. You made it, and you made it big. Congratulations, and continued good luck to you. Ladies and gentlemen, start your ring down. This is it. 
the story remains the same. Man and machine bending time. Obviously, we've seen a lot of great racing in Indianapolis, but this is something special right now. Pushing the limits. To the razor's edge. One of the great races of recent time. At a track. Unbelievable. Where the limits push back. And a crash at turn four. The incredible goal maybe ever in Indianapolis. Big crash oh. down the back straight away. Oh, we've got a crash. Oh, a wicked crash. A singular desire passed down through generations. I've never seen anything like it in the Indianapolis race. Who's going to win? the checkered flag. That's immortality. He's done it. What a minute. And you can see the celebration. The Indianapolis 500. If you got to win one race, this is the place you got to win. Absolutely incredible. Win today. Live forever. I think there is something magical about this place. Memorial Day in Indianapolis. And 33 brave men ready to try to win it all. Time now for another Indy 500 tradition. We send it back to Dave Calabro for the introduction of the one and only Jim Neighbors. Race fans, please turn your attention to the video boards and the victory podium. Since first appearing at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in 1972, this gentleman has become a cherished icon on race day. He has treasured every moment being with you race fans here at the track and with those millions watching around the world. The words of this special song always strike a chord with all of us. And it never sounded sweeter when sung by this Hoosier at heart for the 36th and final time performing back home again in Indiana. Please welcome and sing along with the one, the only, our good friend, Mr. Jim. is about to embark on the most challenging 
racing career. 1,100 miles is the goal, and right now he is about to begin his very first Indianapolis 500. Before he put on the helmet and climbed in the car, I spoke to him. I said, how are your nerves? He smiled and said, I'm feeling it, but I feel good. I've never felt more prepared. Jamie? Well, Kurt Busch is one of seven rookies in today's field, but I'm joined by a man who's no stranger to Indianapolis. Roger Penske, you've been coming here since 1969. What is this moment like? Well, I guess I came here in 1951 with my dad as a young kid, and I could see all these young people here today. It's a special time in my life, and uh, this race is going to be unbelievable. And, uh, I wish the best to Kurt, but he's trying to do the double, and we got three great cars today, and we want a safe race. All those years of being a team owner here, 15 wins. He's hoping today is number 16. Lindsay? Thank you, Jamie. The engines are roaring. The crowd is cheering, and our crew in the booth is standing by to call this race. We send it now to Eddie Cheever, Scott Goodyear, and the newest member of our team, Alan Bestwick. Alan? Lindsay, thanks. Can't tell you how exciting it is to be here for the Indianapolis 500. And as we've gone through the month of May and talked to the drivers, they talk about their cars, they talk about the strategies, but they talk about the emotions of this 500-mile journey. What is today like for the drivers? Today is the most difficult day of the year for them. From the moment they woke up this morning, they've been trying to empty their head of everything that they do not need. They're going to have to focus on the most difficult start you will have anywhere in racing. And you know something, the thing that I always thought about here is coming here into turn one was always a time of tension for drivers, simply from the fact you're rushing down to turn one with 32 of your closest friends at over 200 miles an hour. So it's definitely a hard time for drivers. But the one thing that was for sure is that you come here as a driver, and if you win, you'll leave as a legend. Looking at the 19-year-old rookie Sage Karam, a little slow getting away from the grid, but he is underway and rejoining the field for his first Indianapolis 500-mile race. The starting lineup again reviewed across the top of the screen, and at the head of the field, Mario Andretti, the 1965 winner in the Honda Andretti TV two-seater. Enter for your chance to win a ride with Mario in that car at shophonda.com. That's Gracie Gold, national figure skater with Mario Andretti here in Indianapolis today. And let's stay on the Andretti theme with Dr. Jerry Bunch. You know, Mario Andretti's the only member of his famous family ever to win the Indianapolis 500, and that was way back in 1969. Son Michael came close on several occasions. Grandson Marco came really close as a rookie in 2006. Now, I spoke with Marco this moment before climbing in the car, and if courage and confidence make a difference, this just might be the day the Andretti curse finally ends at Indy. Here's Rick the Bull. Well, few events have the diversity that the Indy 500 has. For example, you've got Jacques Villeneuve out there, 43 years old. He won the Indy 500 back in 1995. Two years later, the Canadian went on to win the Formula One World Championship. But pitted right next to him is the youngest driver in the race, 19-year-old Sage Karam. The kid from Pennsylvania was just two months old when Villeneuve won that Indy 500. Those two drivers today will bridge the generations, connecting Indy's past with its future. Alan? Drivers running 70 miles an hour on this first parade lap behind the Chevrolet Camaro Z28, the 2014 Indianapolis 500 pace car. Like to learn more about it, Chevy.com slash Camaro is where you can find out. Dario Franchitti, heard from him a little while ago, the three-time winner, has received the honor of driving the pace car here today. He has threatened not to turn off and to race him down into turn one. We'll see. Great high definition onboard views for you today among the field of 33. Jacques Villeneuve, the 1995 winner, has our Lucas Oil camera, and the 2000 winner, Juan Pablo Montoya, is carrying our Verizon on board. Tony Canon carrying our Chevy on board, and last year's champion starting 16th. And Tony Canon's teammate Ryan Briscoe, a previous pole sitter here at the Indianapolis 500, will roll off 30th position today in his NTT Data Ganassi Chevrolet. His teammate, Charlie Kimball, is also carrying a camera today, and that will be for the Novo Nordisk Special. And then we also have Graham Rahal, son of 1986-8500 winner Bobby Rahal, who have a National Guard camera on his Honda Power Machine. Graham starts in his seventh 500. Most day. accomplished American driver in the field, Brian Hunter Ray, will have the Outer Nation onboard camera. Marco's Honda onboard camera better get ready for an exciting ride. There's never a moment a boring moment with him. And Simon Pagino with the Firestone on board will be trying to 
replicate his Indy GP fresh win. Elio Castro Nevis trying to win a fourth. 500 in the fourth starting position has our Pensler on board. The current series championship leader, Will Power, driving for Penske, has our Verizon on board from the outside of the front row. And the Sunoco on board being carried by the pole sitter, Ed Carpenter. He will lead this field to the green flag momentarily, hoping to be the 21st driver to win this race from the number one starting spot. Looking for Spanish commentary today, you can find it by activating your SAP button, presented from here in Indianapolis by ESPN Deportes. So many intriguing stories in this field of 33, but one row on the grid particularly worth watching is row number four. Well, the interesting thing about that is two IndyCar drivers and a NASCAR driver. I'm sure those guys have gone over to Kurt Busch and said, hey, let's get through turn one here and just get through a lap before we settle into a pace. So Kurt Busch probably had some great advice from the other two Indy 500 champions. So the Speedway, two and a half miles around for each lap. So to make up the 500 mile distance, they'll run 200 circuits today with that pit window. The crews will have to service the car a minimum of six times during the day. And maybe the most important line is the bottom one. There's always an early crash or early trouble here. You don't want your 500 mile victory dreams ended after five. That is absolutely true. And the first hurdle that they have to get through is that first corner. And it's always a difficult corner because these cars are designed to work it. 220 miles an hour, and Scout and both know you're not even going 180 by the time you get to there. And everybody's always vying to gain that extra foot or two, and it comes at a great price. So there is Mark Cuban, the shark investor from ABC Shark Tank and the owner of the NBA champion of a couple of years ago, Dallas Mavericks. He will have the green flag in his hand a moment from now. He's taking in all the radio instructions he's being given. You want to get it right. And what's the one instruction you give the guy waving the flag? Uh, don't drop, drop it. <laughs> Looks very focused. He probably looks more focused than the drivers do right now. Well, you know, when you talk about driving, I always remember this because you're here all month. It's dark and gray today. Warp color movement fans, and boy, we better get our foot on the gas down to turn one. Three abreast coming to the start. Feel tense. Everybody's extremely tense. Everybody knows that they have to get through it without having a problem, but inevitably somebody will see an opportunity and start racing way too early. But having these three cars abreast is not easy. Everyone wants to win. Only one will. Coming down for the start of the 98th Indianapolis 500 mile race. gobbled up on the outside from his clip and then had to play defense. You know, it's funny, we always talk about getting through turn one like we just did a minute ago, Eddie. You know, because you've been on the front row, I've been on the front row, my goal was to lead to the first turn, the first lap. We say conserve, wait for 500 miles to win this race, but there's a lot of pride at stake. Uh, he's gonna, I think Ed is lining his clip up and he'll get him at the end of the straightaway turning into turn one. And this will be, other than the start, the first real pass of the day. <laughs> Looking, will he get the draft and make that dive on the inside going through? We'll wait and see. Not enough. So Hinchcliffe, Carpenter, Power, Castro Neves up to fourth, just passing Marco and Freddy on that second lap of the race. So at this point of the race, nobody really has a rhythm yet. They're still trying to find out what sort of a car they have. Saw the smoke off the second turn, Ryan Briscoe. Pole winner of a couple of years ago is on the pit lane. Your left rear is down, you're gonna lock up the right front. Left rear, good guy. 
So Briscoe goes a lap down early in the race. Oh. Wow. Briscoe very lucky off of the wall. They were both very lucky. This is a dirty area. He's up a little too high. They call that in the gray area. He's going to run out of track right now. He does a little touch to Villeneuve's car, and he has to respond, go over to the left. Through. Look how sideways he is in the lockup from Davidson's brakes right now. So not that, something you expect on lap one. That smoke we saw was both cars braking, not both cars rubbing of the tires, which was a much better alternative. But we stay on the green and Briscoe back in the race, though one lap down in 33rd position. This race a year ago had 68 lead changes. Weather conditions today a good bit warmer than they were for this race a year ago when I talked to drivers and team managers in the paddock earlier this week, they weren't sure we were going to see that same kind of race because they thought the handling in the warmer weather might get a little edgier. Mind driving when it's hot, they don't like having tested when it's cold and then racing in the heat because they're not quite sure how their cars will react. You see from the Honda telemetry right now, we're getting about 224, 25 miles an hour straight line speed. We're sitting up towards 229, 230. Everybody's trying to get into a pace right now. Watch the throttle and time the guys have to take the foot off the throttle and the car is not working as well as they'd like it to. Now watch the speed here. It's a little faster down the turn three towards the wind. Down one shift. You heard him go down from probably fifth to sixth gear. With the aerial cast and that very smartly going into lines, finished just sitting in fourth and conserving fuel. So the lead group, Hinchcliffe, Carpenter, Power, Castro Neves, Marco Andretti, Scott Dixon running in ninth position. The winner from 2008, and on a lot of folks' minds, including yours and mine, Eddie, as a likely contender for the win today. Scott is a is a method driver with an enormous amount of talent. From the first lap in the race, he has a strategy he's worked out with his engineers. And I have to assume at this point, he's trying to go as fast as he can, feel his car, and he has this magic ability to save fuel. Every little bit of fuel that you save allows you to gain positions on track because you won't be spending that much time in the pits. And he does it so purposely and with such a, a, a professional attitude. He doesn't get caught up in the, in the moment. Early check-in on Kurt Busch and his bid in his first Indianapolis 500. He took the green flag in 12th position. Kurt running in 15th now. This not the car that he intended to run in the race. He had that wicked crash here in practice earlier on Monday. The team deciding to take Marco Andretti's backup car, swap the coloring, and put Kurt Busch in that machine for this race. He was able to get a little bit of practice here on Car Day Friday. And Alan, it's not very often you get away with the type of crash that he had and walk away from it with some type of injury. So he was very lucky, but he did say that he just let his guard down just for a minute, and he found himself going into the wall. If they were to name a Mr. Congeniality in racing, it'd be the guy who's leading. The bright personality of James Hinchcliffe also is pretty darn fast behind the wheel at the Brickyard. The second lead change of the Indianapolis 500. After James Hinchcliffe got the lead from Ed Carpenter on the start, Carpenter has gone back around Hinchcliffe and is out in front. The pole winner last year did not get the finish he was hoping for. Carpenter hoping to win from pole position this season. He leads after 13 laps. On the move in the early going, the series champion for the Rise of IndyCar Series a couple of years ago, Florida's Ryan Hunter Ray. Last year he was leading on that last restart and he got shuffled back to third place. I'm sure he's one of those many drivers that spent the whole winter running through that restart in his head. Perfect pass. And every time he ran it through his head, he came up with a different finish. But you can hear, Scott, that the drivers are not that much on a limit right now as they take their throttle off every time they go into the corner. That's not just because of traffic, but they're trying to gauge how their car is working. Doc? Ryan Hunter Ray said he has got to get out of where he started in a hurry. Starting back in 19th position, he told his crew, I've got to get up in the top 10. I know what happens back here, and I don't want to be a part of it. Now, his teammates are trying to save fuel. Hunter Ray said, I'm not worried about saving gas until I get in the top three. Then I'll 
that saving gas thing, it sounds weird for folks who may watch the Indianapolis 500 and don't watch auto racing regularly, but saving fuel is a critical part of how you operate at top speed. For more on the driver who might be trying to save a little fuel by giving up the lead, here's Jamie. And that would be James Hinchcliffe, and that was exactly by design, Alan. He said, I don't want to be out here leading, and he stayed up there for nine laps, so he tucked in behind Head Carpenter. Now remember, James Hinchcliffe has had a heck of a month, Alan. He suffered a concussion just two weeks ago in the GP race here at Indy. He wasn't cleared to drive for five days, and that set the team back, but he managed to go out and qualified on the front row and told me, I don't know what we have for today. Well, so far, so good, Alan race cars with open tops. Hinchcliffe taking a piece of debris off the head at 170 miles an hour. And after having to sit out a few days, was medically clear to drive. Qualified on the front row as Jamie said, and he's running second right now. Update on Kurt Busch from the pit lane. Vince? Kurt Busch started 12th. He's lost four positions to 16th, but don't worry. They wanted him to just settle in and get comfortable. It's a long race, 500 miles. They weren't looking to grab spots early on. Get comfortable, get used to the speed, get used to the traffic. And his team told me before he got in the car today, they've been so impressed with him to this point. He's been like a sponge, soaking up all the information every bit he can. Even attending meetings he wasn't required to attend. They believe they're going to have a good day with Kurt Busch in the car today. We're just 17 laps in, but hardly any communication from him on the radio. That's normally a good sign, Alan. So Kurt Busch holding steady while Juan Pablo Montoya has given up a couple of positions in the opening few laps of the race. The 2000 winner of the 500 back uh, in IndyCar racing started 10th. He's running back in 12th now. In fact, just picked up one of the positions he lost and gained it back. So now Montoya running in the 11th position, Rick. Well, Montoya got on the radio just a few minutes ago and told the crew the car is understeering just a bit. But even going into this race, he said, to be honest with you, the first half of this race really is just about learning, relearning this IndyCar experience so he can set himself up for those last 30 laps. And that understeer that they're talking about, Alan, is that from the front maybe doesn't turn as well as he wants it to. Now, the driver in today's cars does have some cockpit aids that he can actually make some adjustments in the car. There's a weight jacker, there's a button on the steering wheel, he can change the weight from one side of the car to the other side in the front, make it turn a little bit better. And also the roll bars, those things that we have in our road cars that are just underneath there that we don't really know about. Well, drivers can change those as they're out there on the racetrack, changing the handling of the car. Driver on the move in the early going, J.R. Hildebrand, the, Cal the uh, California native, now living in Colorado, started the race in ninth position, and Doc, he's moved up to fifth. Indeed, he is on the move, Alan, and back on Farm Bay when the track temperature was 109 degrees, he came in and did something very daring. They changed the rear shocks or dampers. They made a major rear wing adjustment. They have put all their money in hoping this track would be 110 degrees and hotter on race day. Well, I have just checked with the Barstow. but 117 and a half in the corners. Maybe that's why Hildebrand is on the move. At this point of the race, the drivers now know what sort of a car they have under them. Hopefully, they're in a range where they can make small improvements and make the car faster as the day goes on. But as Doc said, the racetrack is going to get hotter and hotter, and you have to be able to get there with a setup that works. You have to be able to manipulate a lot of different things. Well, the teams will get their first chance to lay their hands on the car since the green flag waves when the first round of pit stops begins shortly. We've just completed 50 miles at the Indianapolis 500. Look at the people. Look at the sunshine. How spectacular. The Indianapolis Motor Speedway on the day of the 500-mile race. And hometowner Ed Carpenter from Indiana, Butler University graduate, is out front. He has led 16 of the 25 laps that have been completed so far. Average speed is over 217 miles an hour. And looking at the telemetry, we can see that he's going as fast as he can because the throttle is remaining 100% the whole way around the track. That as Scott pointed out earlier, he probably has his fuel trim all the way down to saving fuel. So they have a variety of different adjustments they can make. But he is going as fast as he can right now. Thank Honda for helping bring you the onboard telemetry today here at the Brickyard. And I'm also noticing about 217, 218 going into one. A little faster top speed going into three because they have a headwind into one, a tailwind into three. Drivers will have to look at those wind socks on the racetrack when they go into the turns to adjust their lines through the turns. All that as you're turning to the turns about 215, 20, 25 miles an hour, Eddie. It's always something we're very busy. And as we're looking right now, that windsock is up on top of that grand 
grandstand. So the driver takes his view off the ropes track for a minute and looks up and talks to the stand. It's pretty mind-boggling for those of us that haven't driven a race car that you're doing 220 miles an hour into the corner and looking at a windsock. Tony Kanaan, last year's winner. You see moving up some since the stock. Look at those hands. Uh, exactly. That's exactly what I was just going to point out. We were on board with Ed Carpenter. Smooth on the steering wheel. His car was working well. We saw Tony reach up with his right hand and tear something off the front of his visor. That's called a visor strip because all the dirt that comes onto your helmet can make it hard to see. There's a little thin layer of plastic there. It tears, it tears it off. He'll have 10 of those on for today's event. Yeah, it's one of the greatest feelings in the world. It's like being on a long road trip and stopping at the gasoline station and they clean the windshield wiper for you. It's a whole new view on life and it was a great uplifter. Never looked at it that way. Now right behind Kanaan, the driver who's gained the most positions in the opening 27 laps of this race, Californian Townsend Bell, Rick. And Townsend Bell has a little bit of a secret weapon. He's driving for the same team that Tony Kanaan drove for last year. And while that is not the same car that won the Indy 500, they are using the exact same setup that Kanaan used last year. Used it coming off the truck, it worked perfectly. As a result, they pretty much kept to it, and they expected to keep it that way for the rest of the race. He's been able to move from 25th all the way up to 12th. That little attempted pass we cut off to there with Ryan hunter Ray on Joseph Newgarden had my two former driving partners up here in the booth going... <laughs> don't think a lot of that. The, the outside car that's being passed holding its line all the way up there that early on in the race. Well, there's a difference now. We're a lot older sitting up here. He's a lot younger <laughs> sitting in there. That's the difference. Yeah. Well, Townsend Bell definitely is on a, on a tear, isn't he? Yeah. I mean, he's right up the gearbox. Here's the race leader on the pit lane after 28 laps. Complete, working the 29th, and headed all the way down to Jamie. And Ed Carpenter told me they were really focused on making sure their car was the fastest in the race. They learned their lesson last year, and they wanted to focus on having a good handling race car. Ed said the car is great, whether he was in traffic or leading the race. So far, so good for the 20. You see him change four tires here. They'll fill him up with Sunoco fuel, and the great thing for him, he's in the number one pit box, so he has a clear out right ahead. And a lap after Carpenter, James Hinchcliffe, who took over the lead when Carpenter pits, bails out, comes to the pit lane. These drivers have to slow down from 200 miles an hour exiting turn four to 60 miles an hour when they hit the pit entry. They get some help electronically in maintaining that speed, but boy, they've got to be on their toes when it's time to make a pit stop. Jamie? And James Hinchcliffe told me exactly that before he got in the car. He's really banking on his pit crew today to help him maintain that track position up front. No changes expected here. You see that awesome overhead shot right there looking down into the, the box as they fill him up there. The fuel so far, so good. 8.6 seconds to change four tires and fill him up. There was such a great amount of relief from the teams, Alan, when the new drivers have done that first pit stop and don't have any problems. A bad first pit stop will set a really bad tone for the rest of the race. You see a whole flock on the pit lane. Including Will Power now, who just gave up the lead to make his pit stop here. Now will Power not operating at 100%, got a stomach virus earlier in the week, missed media day, didn't go to New York to promote anything. He's been taking care of himself, taking on fluids. He said he's taking it lap by lap to see how they can pull this on. Looking for a good finish, perhaps a win for the 12. And his teammate, Helio Castroneves, another good stop. They're out in clean. Scott Dixon coming out, Ryan Hunter Ray, Justin Wilson, Jack Hawksworth, Charlie Kimball. In that group, Tony Kanaan took over the lead when power pitted. Now Kanaan blowing down to that 60 miles an hour. The silver paint color target celebrating 25 years as a partner with Chip Ganassi's team. You were talking about slowing down from 220 to 50 miles an hour. They cannot take their time doing that, so they try to get all that deceleration done in probably 50 yards at the entrance of the pits. Saw a quick change in the front wing of Tony's car telling me that he probably had just a little bit of understeer, parted, turned as well as he wanted to through the traffic probably, so they made an adjustment for him during his pit stop. And one of the rookies making his first pit stop in a 500, Vince. Well, that was Michaela Lotion who came in. You saw a little wiggle there as he's trying to get the tires warmed up upon exit. And no major changes for this car. His first ever oval race in any kind of race car at all. Can you imagine that being the Indianapolis 500? That's the challenge Lotion is facing so far here in this uh, day today at Indianapolis. From what I know, there aren't many ovals in Moscow. 
So the cycle of pit stops has run through. And there you see the front four. Hitchcliffe, Carpenter, Power, and Castro Evans. Then a couple of seconds of racetrack back to J.R. Hildebrand and Marco Andretti, who run in fifth and sixth. Now this first group of four cars, Scott, has an opportunity. If they get together, they can the field behind them, but they have to work together. The first round of pit stops is done. Team Penske working on power and Castro Nevis. We're back to the Brickyard after this from your ABC station. The 98th running of the Indianapolis 500 on ABC. Brought to you by Mother's High Performance Car Care Products. Formulated for fanatics. And Comfort Suites. Your sweet success. New leader at the 98th Indianapolis 500 mile race. After the pit stops, Will Power driving for Roger Penske was in third position. He passed second place at Carpenter and then first place James Hitchcliffe and Power. The Verizon IndyCar Series championship leader starting today is now out in front here at Indy. He's a new man this year after winning his last race in Fontana. A look at the pass for the lead. After those pit stops, he came out. He seemed to have a very Good car underneath him. He turned around, got past Ed Carpenter. A nice timing coming out of turn two. I, a great draft. Gets I, the pass completely clear. before it gets into turn three, which is exactly what you want to do. You try not to go into turn beside the guy, is what we call it, make it confrontational because it's only a one line racetrack here at Indianapolis. So this is the first time he's had any laps in clean air. So what he's doing is putting in his database and trying to tell his engineers what his car will be like should he be leading on those last restarts. Everything you see now, the drivers are trying to accumulate information to work towards those last 20 laps. And he looks pretty strong when he's in front. And we should add that all that information the driver sees on his electronic dash is being back to the pit lane by real-time telemetry. So all that information off the car goes to the engineers. They get to assess it. They get to see what type of car the driver now has. As you can see, Townsend Bell do a great pass. Get around Simon Pagano for a spot. That's the 13th, make that 12th position that Bell just picked up. Bell does a really good job for somebody who just comes and races here once a year. He's always in the mix of things. Most of the rookies in the field are kind of clustered together on the racetrack, including one of the youngest drivers here who had a little hiccup getting off the grid, but now is charging forward. Rick? And you have to be so impressed with what this kid is doing right now. 19 years old, not just a rookie in his first IndyCar oval race, but the youngest driver in this race. The team has been coaching him through, telling him what to do. He was talking about he was having a little bit of understeer. The car was having a few issues, but he started 31st and is now racing in 19th and is keeping his nose clean, and that's what really matters. That was great, Rick, but right in the middle of all that, he just passed the car on the outside of one. And that was called take that because Michaela Lotion tried to block him down the main straight, took him all the way down to the wall, and he said, okay, I'll go around the outside. And that's exactly what he did. And it's not a great place to live this early on in the race, up high in one. This kid is on a march to the front of the rope, the front of the uh, line. And power continues to lead. New second place runner, Ed Carpenter, around James Hitchcliffe. So Carpenter to the number two spot and trying to creep in and join that front four that had a little bit of a gap on the rest of the field after the pit stops is uh, J.R. Hildebrand who is closed in now and make that a Graham Ray Hall on the pit lane. That doesn't look good, Rick. Yeah, Graham Ray Hall has been having some problems, concerned about the back end of the car. It wasn't going well. And then in their last pit stop, they couldn't get the jack to work properly. As a result, it was a very slow pit stop, bringing him in again, trying to work out some of the problems. He's had a pretty tough month overall. Hasn't been able to get the speed. and really hasn't been able to figure out why they haven't been able to get the speed. And it doesn't look like today's going to go any better for them. Do you feel it tight enough or anything like that? I do. That's all. Awesome. Now, generally, when they talk about tightening up, they're talking about what's under the engine cover. It could be that, or it could also be maybe a problem in the gearbox or something. Yeah, There's that jack, jack falling off. Jack went up and down, and, you know, Graham has had a struggling uh, week. I got an opportunity to play in the uh, Graham Rahal Foundation Golf Tournament this week, and he really shared with me, he just said, I'm not sure why we don't have the speed or the grip, but it's actually very, very tough to be able to be out there in the racetrack. 
J.R. Hildebrand looking for third place. And he's got it in turn one. Very nicely done. Now we heard in the garage all of this last couple of weeks, you know, we don't want to lead too much. We don't want to be racy too early because we want to save fuel. We want to get great fuel mileage for this race. But any of you know from putting your helmet on, getting inside the cockpit, you just want to get out there and get racy and get to the front. That is true, but you also have somebody in the pits that's worked out the strategy. You have to adhere to it. And at the same time, go quick. And it's very difficult. Every time that you do a stint, and you use maybe one gallon less, that's one gallon less that to put in your car. And how much is, how much is that? How much is two seconds in the straightaway? 150 yards? A couple hundred. Elio castro is fending off Marco and ready for a spot. Want to go back and tidy up the Graham Rahal story for just a minute and uh, see if Rick has any more information on that, Rick? Yeah, he came on. Just shut off. That's the problem. He's been having the suspension problems I talked about earlier in terms of the setup, but this is a much bigger problem. He said for whatever reason, the union shut off, no warning. Now he's in pit lane, and they're trying to sort out the problem. That's tough luck for the start of the 1986 winner. Now, just on the racetrack a minute ago, Elio Castroneves was given a warning by race control. Castroneves in that yellow car warned for blocking. Oh. Yes, that, that is not proactive, Scott. What they told the drivers is that you can make the first move on either side of the racetrack, but you cannot react to what's happening behind you. Marker under here. Behind him, starting to look. He makes a move. And Inside. All of a sudden, Inside. Over. A Inside. lot of dirty air going on to the nose of Marco Andretti's car. You saw how quickly he fell back because the air that comes off the car in front really disturbs the handling of your car. So how many warnings do you get before they call you in and wrap your knuckles? You sat in driver's meetings like I have, they don't give you that information. Otherwise, it would be seven, three through six, wouldn't you? Or seven. Well, here comes Hinchcliffe. Castro is looking to get around Hinchcliffe for fourth spot. And Marco is a all over him, isn't he? Yep. Now, interesting that with all the super teams, right, and Freddy Autosport as we ride with Marco, uh, got Team Penske leading, Chip Ganassi racing teams with so many wins here at Indianapolis in recent years. A team with cars in two of the top three spots is one of the smaller teams in IndyCar racing. Ed Carpenter normally runs a single car effort that he shares. Ed drives the ovals. Mike Conway, expert road course racer, already a winner this season, drives in the road course races. But now with an effort for J.R. Hildebrand here at Indy, expanding to a two-car effort, their two cars are in the top three spots, Jamie. That's not bad. Not bad, and it's gone so smoothly. Ed told me this has been the best he's felt at Indy because he has a teammate. He said it has gone off without a hitch. He's kept his eye on J.R. Hildebrand since J.R. got fired from Panther Racing last year. He said he saw something in this kid, and he said their setups have been similar, and it is helping both drivers be better, and it's showing here. For more on that side, let's go to Right behind him is Hildebrand in the 21 car. J.R. Hildebrand said, my focus here is to prove that Ed Carpenter made the right decision to bring me here. As you watch a pass behind him, and a mix up there, Elio Castroneves making a move. And Hildebrand said, I want to prove to everybody I belong back in Indianapolis, and Carpenter brought me here for the right reason. Now with Hildebrand behind Ed Carpenter, that's his teammate. Let's see if these two drivers can work together because they really are, Scott, in the perfect position. Help each other in the draft, help each other manage the fuel, help with everything. Ed Carpenter, family ties so deep to the Speedway, his love for the place so strong, he's hoping to drink the milk today. We are across the one quarter mark of the Indianapolis 500 already. Will Power out in front, one of five different drivers that have traded the lead eight times, caution free to this point. Graham Rahal's car is the slow one you see on the inside. They sent him back out, obviously haven't gotten all the problems on that machine fixed up. And Rahal is looking to make his way back around to the pit lane. They're gonna begin. Watch this, Townsend Bell, Tony Kanaan, Yikes! He hit Tony Kanan's car that looks like he brushed up against the wall. Everybody's being very defensive very early on. 
this race. Normally you'd see that sort of thing of the last 40, 50 laps. Well, and it's all on the front stretch, Eddie, Eddie, and I think that's the reason because we have a headwind going down the front stretch. So that means you're pushing more air with your car, and the car behind you getting the draft gets another advantage because of that. So everybody's taking the advantage. Oh, look of at that this. In between. Side by side. My goodness. In between three and four. Juan Pablo Montoya around Townsend Bell into 10th position oh, and a scoreboard. Ryan Hunter Ray in the yellow car. Has somebody told him the race is going to be a shorter <laughs> version of the 500? <laughs> the Kumasato doing a great job in AJ Foyt's ABC machine. He didn't take his foot off the gas. He was just going to find a place to go. Early racing, very early on. You know, when I watch this, I, Eddie, you and I have talked about this before, that when we were doing it, it seemed normal. And now that we're up here watching it, and I talked to Dario Franchini about that, and I think he said it on the air here this morning, that he's now watching it and realized just how much on the edge we lived our lives by doing it. But when you're doing it each and every day, you don't even think about it. I've hit things at 230 miles an hour, and it's not a pleasant experience. There goes Castro Nevis making a nice move on J.R. Hildebrand. Into fourth place. Marco Andretti went through Hildebrand earlier, up to third. These same cars and stars will run in Detroit next weekend. You'll see both ends of the Indy Duel in Detroit here on ABC. Saturday, 3.30 Eastern. Sunday, 3.30 Eastern. Really demanding on the drivers and teams. The two-mile, 14-turn course running two races in the weekend instead of one. Should be a lot of fun. And it's diametrically opposite of this. Yeah, it's a lot of stop and go and right in the city park. Now watch for Marco getting a nice draft going on here. Andretti before, he's a man that's very busy in the cockpit, and he's using the buttons in the steering wheel for the weight jacker, making the car handle better, he was also using the roll bar, and he seemed to be doing that on each end of the racetrack because of the difference in wind. I think that's why he's advanced his car. Beginning to see the next round of green flag pit stops, Jack Hawksworth, very impressive young driver from England. Marco just passed as passes. the car goes One lap. Lead. That was the roar of the crowd that you heard, and it put... Will Power off pace there for a minute because he took away the air going through the turn and Ed Carpenter almost got a chance to get past him. Now watch Elio, he'll take advantage of this. But it's very late. Just like that, how quickly you can go backwards. And a little wiggle from the Pennzoil machine in the middle of turn one, wow. Looks like Castro Nevis is starting to pick up the pace. I expect him to be attacking Power probably at the end of the next straightaway. Well, it's interesting, Power's car was so good after the pit stop, now it's starting to go away. Doc Ebsen, Marco Pat, Pat, Pat Pagino in for his service. The car handling better than he liked. Still a bit of an understeer and a wing change. Four tires and he was away. All of the people in this front stretch grandstand, these massive stands, the tower over the racetrack when Marco Andretti took the lead, rose to their feet with a cheer. Family so popular, one of the biggest families in the history of motorsports, and what it would mean, what a reaction it would get if Marco Andretti could win. The biggest advantage any driver has had since the beginning of this race. He seems to be pulling away Scott from the group. And you just saw his left hand was off the steering wheel again there for a moment, reaching down, operating the roll bars, as I mentioned before. Those roll bars change the handling of the car, either the front or the rear. There his hand goes again. Now he's adjusting it, and the weight jacker is pushing the button. He changes the car for each end of the racetrack because the car handles differently at each end because of the wind difference. That's a brilliant driver. Look at the throttle, full throttle. That's as fast as she goes. Think of these steering wheels on these race cars almost like an Xbox controller. They have all kinds of different buttons that control different things from the weight jacker Scott was talking about to the fuel usage settings to powering the drink bottle that services the driver to putting it in neutral, to putting it in reverse. Out they have to stay out another lap. Good fuel mileage, stay out one more lap. Yeah, he's getting sucked in the pack. It's impossible here to run away from everybody. But I think he's made a statement that he is definitely one of the people you're going to have to beat today if you're going to win this race. Eddie, you remember when he came here, he was leading that last lap, got passed by Sam Hornish, 
going down the front stretch and finished second. I've talked to him many times about it. I understand what he feels because I finished second here twice, and it just grinds on you each time you come back here if you don't have the opportunity to win. And, by the way, his last name is Andretti. That puts a little more pressure on it. Let's see if he comes into the pits. Into the pits. Will Power follows him in, but not Castro Nevis. Castro Nevis stays out. And Castro Nevis was in the middle of that group island the whole time, so maybe he's managed to stretch his field a bit more. Doc? Marco Andretti, when the race began, so the car was sliding, but Kyle Moyer added downforce with a turn up front and a turn of rear wing. It's going to be more total downforce, which Marco really likes. There should be tires and fuel only this time, trying to get it completely full. Right side, left side tires going on. No other adjustment from our full summer with the outside rear. Well, power remember the focus is on his finger when nailing it. Two bad pit stops in a row at the end of last year. Well said, cost him the win. So far, two down, good to go. And he came out ahead of Marco Andretti. Just a small miscue by the pit crew as it was there because they feel the pressure also in these pit stops, not only the driver. Another wave in, led by Elio Castroneves, Jamie. His team very focused. Roger Penske has been coming here a long time. He is the strategist. He is calling the shots for Elio Castroneves. He talks to his driver and tells him what he's thinking. If Elio agrees, they do it. Otherwise, they negotiate. Four tires go on. A little turn of front wing. A little bit of understeer. We're hearing a lot of that man. Car a little bit too free for his liking. Tires changed and a little turn of front wing to give him some more stability. He'd lost about seven spots prior to that pit stop. Juan Pablo Montoya, the leader now. Scott Dixon led a lap. He'll come down to the pit lane as Kurt Busch heads back out onto the track. That slippery exit on cold tires around that exit lane to get back up to speed. That's Scott Dixon has liked his race car. They did make a slight front wing adjustment in his first stop. No changes of that nature here on this one. He's held steady toward the front. Said he wanted to run in the top six or seven early on, and that's right where he's been. Let's go back to those changes that Marco Andretti made to this car. Putting more rear wing and more front wing at this early in the race is a big change. That's not a small bit of adjustment. Certainly gain some grip. You can also change tire pressures to create do some side by side. Man. And right in front of the leader, Montoya. J.R. Hildebrand still trying to gather it up. And you see the car wiggling with him underneath there? It's his side. Ricky? Tony Kanan brings the car in. They made a minor air, chest, air pressure adjustment in the tires last time, along with a wing pressure, a wing, wing adjustment as well. The goal is to make those minor, minor changes. He's been happy with the car overall. So now he's got a problem in the back. They were trying to make, looks like they're trying to make a rear wing adjustment, and it's going a little bit longer than they anticipated. There is a small device in the back where you can change the angle of the wing. When they have a problem with that, obviously it's going to take a lot longer. And you see him go in the back, they've got to restart the car as well. So now you've got a problem in the back. You see the frustration with Tony Kanan as his hands go up in the air. This is an awful lot of time during green flag situations to be sitting in the back of this car. It would take a miracle to get him back in the race after having lost this many seconds in the pit, Scott, to have a chance of winning. A lot of people making rear wing adjustments. It looks like the track is a lot slicker than they expected to, and Marco and Reddy's group were the first ones to jump onto that by changing the rear wing. It almost sounds like Kurt Busch needs a little bit of rear wing because his car is so loose, and that's what caught him out when he had that, his, his accident in two. Now, Juan Pablo Montoya ran four laps longer than Marco Andretti did on that stint on fuel. Might be important later in the race. Castro Neves in the yellow three is the leader. Andretti is second right behind him after the cycle of pit stops. And Andretti is very quick and very confident right now. He fought his way up through that whole group. And now I think he's going to either decide to save some fuel since he knows he has a good car or attack Castro Neves. So the race for the lead. At the Indianapolis 500 mile race, Castro Neves and Andretti, Jessica Mace changing that front left tire for Jacques Villeneuve at work along with all the other pit crew members here at the Brickyard. There's the lead group. 
As we approach already 200 miles of the Indianapolis 500, Elio Castroneves, yellow car, the race leader, followed by Marco Andretti, Ed Carpenter, and now Ryan Hunter Ray, after starting 19th all the way up to fourth position. While those drivers are having great days so far, disappointment for Graham Ray Hall, his car being pushed back to Gasoline Alley. The report we get uh, is that there are electrical problems that will take the 15 out of the race. And Tony Kanaan still sitting frustrated on the pit lane, Rick. Okay, here's what we understand happened. Apparently he ran the car out of fuel. As a result, he coasted in, they had to refire. When they went to refire the engine, they apparently stripped out the gear. And you thought here on pit wall, they are now working on the starter to kind of re-engage the gears to make sure that they're stronger. They've had to pull the spline out of the back of the car, so when they put the new starter back in, it will engage properly. Meanwhile, Tony Kanaan sits on in his car waiting and obviously any opportunity, any chance of a good finish here at the Indy 500 on his return visit after his victory is over. Wow. Well, when uh, when things go wrong, they go wrong. And for Tony Kanaan, one problem leads to another problem that leads to uh, the ultimate problem, which is he's not going to win this year's Indianapolis 500. Listen. Okay, here we are. So you hear the car not running when he came to the pit lane, as Rick described, out of fuel. And that problem leading to the problem of trying to restart the car, which leads to the problem of the stripped starter gear, and on and on and on we He's go. the Indy 500 champion for another 125 laps. Just before his pit stop, while he was leading, Marco Andretti said this. And a small blister on the right rear that time. Small blister, but so everything's okay. The radio information from Kyle Moyer, who operates the radio and tells Marco Andretti what's going on and gives him some strategy. And that's probably why we saw Marco very active with the driver's tools inside the car, not to over push the car. The Pippa Man's going very slow there. That's the one with the pink and white machine. That is so a slow that she's creating a bit of a traffic jam there for all the other cars coming out of the turn. This is a side of the racetrack to get into the pit lane but she's so far off the speed she can't really go and take that lower lane away from people she should strongly consider coming into the pits and trying to find the reason why she's so far off the pace because the drivers behind her will get increasingly frustrated and they might make a move that they would regret well, and if she doesn't come in now with the pace that she's running i'm sure that race control will look at her speed and tell her she needs to come in make some changes to the car get back out if she can bring the car back to speed They'll leave her out. If not, they'll tell her to come back in. But so far in this race, we've seen Hunter Ray fight his way all the way to the front without any fuss, very cleanly. We've seen Marco Andretti make some big changes to his car and pick up more downforce. And, and here goes seeing. <laughs> here goes Ed Carpenter on the outside again into turn one and easily makes the pass. And you know what we're seeing here is usually people come down, make a move to the inside of turn one and get the pass completed but Eddie we've seen today guys are coming out they're going high they're going low they're going wherever they have to to complete the pass Elio Castroneves can he make it for Indianapolis 500 mile win we know that Graham Rahal will not be the one drinking the milk today let's check downstairs a very frustrating month to say the least for Graham Ray Hall and obviously caught start up by asking what puts you out of the race? Well we got some little electrical gremlin. I didn't think the car ran right from the start it was just slow and uh, sure enough the engine keeps shutting off and so we ran back out a couple times trying to fix it and uh, we don't see it there's nowhere in the data that shows it but the engine just shuts off all the time so you can't go racing like that but you know it's tough I uh, First race with the National Guard here on Memorial Day weekend. We wanted to make them proud. I mean, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to succeed today. It's just nothing we can do. I mean, our luck the last four years has been brutal, and I don't know what we have to do to turn it around, but uh, this uh, this team is made up of champions, and uh, everybody's going to try very hard, very, very hard, and, uh, you know, try to improve and make all the National Guards, men and women out there proud. But today's just not our day, you know. I, I don't know what else to say. And as he said, a lot of great people on this team. The problem is trying to get the results that match the quality. 
Cranberry Hall, the first driver out of the Indianapolis 500 for 2014. Elio Castroneves, the race leader. We're back to the Brickyard after this from your ABC station. The 98th running of the Indianapolis 500 on ABC. Brought to you by Sunoco, the official fuel of IndyCar. And Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. The viewing mounds down the back straightaway of the greatest race course in the world, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. After the rather difficult winter a lot of these folks had in the Midwest, enjoying a 79 degree Sunday of Memorial Day weekend and the 98th running of the 500. Elio Castroneva is out in front. Ed Carpenter now running second. Marco Andretti has dropped to third. Ryan Hunter Ray has moved all the way up from 19th starting spot to fourth. Visible vibration coming in now. Interesting. Yeah, but it doesn't seem to be affecting him. He's just giving him as much information as he can give them, and uh, they, they can tell. You're a driver behind the wheel. You call in a vibration that's going to concern you at these speeds with those walls moving around you. And yet the crew sees the data, and they come right back to you calmly like that and say, yeah, we see it, it's just this. that make you feel better? Much better. Okay. Do you believe them? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> In, in, a, in a race like this, when you have a car that's in fourth place and you came all the way back from the back, you do want, you'll believe just about anything they'll say. What you're telling me? Ten more laps, ten more. Ten more laps as you see him changing gears. Start thinking about. Uh, oh. Thinking about the uh, Still thinking about? No, he said start. Start thinking about, but then yeah. he got busy in the corner. Yeah. Those dang corners came up again. Yeah, uh, you can see the fuel turn. Changing the weight jacket with his left hand. With that thumb, you saw him changing the fuel trim by that silver knob that he did. And that uh, vibration could just be some stuff getting on the tire. You hope it's that versus what's going on maybe with that drive shaft or CV joint. But as we're watching the Honda telemetry, he's on that gas a pretty long time around here, working out well. Simon Pagano, which is ahead of him, is uh, slowing this group down. What a run. The biggest mover in this race, the 19-year-old who skipped his high school prom to race in the Indianapolis 500. Sage Carum from Nazareth, Pennsylvania, known for race fans as the hometown of the Andretti clan. And he was, they, they didn't allow him to do, look at this, he's making well, a run. Inside, outside, he, they didn't let him run as much as he would have wanted to during the uh, week of testing because they wanted to make sure he got up to speed progressively, but uh, they can't stop him now in the race. So Carum up from 31st starting spot, now challenging Juan Pablo Montoya for seventh. Right behind Sage Carum, a driver who was up in the top three earlier, but he's fallen back. J.R. Hildebrand from third, now back to the ninth. Just like that, a lap at 200 miles an hour around the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. It wasn't just a lap, it was a traffic jam at 220 miles an hour. Caram's in, Rick. Well, the 19-year-old kid from Pennsylvania has done an incredible job. They have made no adjustments on the car so far. The goal was quite simply just to finish this race. But now that he's in the top 10, I have no doubt that his goals are moving up quite a bit. Watch your speed here. That's great information for rookies that are here. Watch your speed, 60 miles an hour through the pit lane. And that getting out on the track lap, Alan, is so important because with the cold tires, you can overdrive the car and throw it to the wall. We see many drivers do that. I'm sure spotters will be on the radio telling them, just take your time. Now, beginning to get to the window where the next round of green stops for the race leaders will happen. I think we've got a little bit of a cat and mouse game going on on the racetrack. Or if you prefer more elegant, elegant terms, a strategic play on fuel strategy by some of these leaders. When you're out in front, you're breaking more of the wind and using more air. The cars running back in the draft are able to run at less than 100% throttle more easily. They're using less fuel. What's the advantage? The more fuel you have to take, the longer you're sitting still 
on pit road. The less fuel you have to take, the less you're sitting still on a pit stop on pit road. And the guys that are able to save fuel, the track position might change on a wave of stops. That, that's exactly right. And right now, all of the teams or strategies are starting to crystallize. Pretty soon, you will not be able to change your, your strategy unless a yellow pops up. So, hard to believe, but we've been caution-free through this race so far at an average speed of 213 miles an hour. Since records for yellow flags started being kept here at the Speedway in 1976, the longest time to the first yellow flag had been 66 laps. We're now at lap 91. Haven't seen a yellow yet. The 95 winners in. Jacques Villeneuve, back at the Speedway after 19 years. And I sat with him, talked with him, caught up with him in the garage just about uh, a week ago. First, I've asked him why. He said, racing is my oxygen. I need to do it. He won here in 1995. I had a great battle with him. We all know about the pace car incident. And I asked him, you've been away from here so long. Why? He said, just simply because I have to go racing. As I mentioned, racing is my oxygen. And the other thing that was interesting, he said to me, when I went out there, I went around 180 miles an hour and thought this place was super fast. And then 190, then 200. Took me a long time. In the time, guys. In the time. Back in the long. Elliot Cashford Evans gives up the lead. Following the rookie James Davison, who's exiting from his pit stop. Jamie? 60 mile per hour down pit lane. Elio Castroneves has led the most laps today of any other driver, which is making him a bigger threat. His car not only is good out in clean air, his car is good back in the pack around other cars. Elio said three laps ago to Roger Pesky, I don't need any changes. The car is that good. Leave it alone. Give me new tires. Fill it up with Sunoco fuel that took extra time. That's a bit too long. 10.2 for Elio Castroneves. Now we need to see when Carpenter comes in. He did a lot of following Captain Evans in this segment of the race. Mikhailo Lotion in, and there are troubles on the back end of that seven car. Very impressive, very quick in his rookie season, and in his first ever trip here to the Speedway on an oval track. First ever oval track, period. Here's Marco Andretti. in for four tires. They wanted to be very careful and very deliberate with him. He was actually trying to save fuel and being very cognizant about the blistering right rear tire he had before. Thank Ryan Hunter Ray now coming down Pittman. What a run by Hunter Ray from 19th starting spot all the way to third. Although he's been very busy inside the car, he has had his hands full. They've been yelling, use your bar, use your bar. They told him a quarter turn wing. Also pull on the bodywork. Pull on the body with four tires for Hunter Ray. Jamie. And Carpenter makes the long track all the way down pit road, avoids the cars exiting their pit box. Four tires and fuel for Ed Carpenter. Their main focus has been fuel today, but the balance of the car, so far, so good. Interesting to note that Scott Dixon has run longer than almost everyone else on the last two stints of this race on fuel, Vince. Not only is he running longer on fuel, but he really likes the handling of his race car. Also, they did make a front wing adjustment on that first stop, but no adjustments at all on the second. No front wing adjustment, no rear adjustment. We've heard a lot of teams adding down for us, but Dixon seems like his car is in the right window. And remember, this team won the pit stop competition on Friday, so they've got one of the best over the wall crews in the business to help him as well. And for me, it looked like their pit stop was about a second quicker than Penske's. Now, yeah. Sorry, Eddie. Right? And that could be a function of how much fuel they have to put in his tank. Wrapping around that fuel story, Montoya also running longer on fuel last stint and again on this one. Now, the more laps that we do, the more important that becomes when you get down to that last pit stop because oh, if you're okay. less, your, your position on yeah, the track will be less. Okay. Okay. all the way onto pit lane, but not yet. So after Montoya pits, 
it'll become Ryan Hunter Ray, who's the new leader, followed by Elio Castro Neves. There will be the lead group. Hunter Ray, Castro Neves, that's Marco Andretti, and then Scott Dixon. They'll be your first four, and Carpenter will fall back to fifth after Montoya completes the cycle of stops. So I think we're starting to see what's going to happen in the last quarter of the race. And the leader goes by the pit lane again, and still out there stretching that fuel. I, I didn't quite understand that. Something about the draft. My interpretation on it was he can save when he's in the draft a lot. A lot more than he can when he's out here by himself. Which... He, he speaks Spanish? And you hear him working the gearbox too, because he's going through the gearbox quite a lot. Probably trying to keep the RPM down. No, I speak garbled race car radio. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes garbled. Better be coming in the pits this time because he's been out a lot. There we go. At halfway, as we complete two hey, miles, nice and easy. Come on down. The race leader, Juan Pablo Montoya, comes in. Ryan Hunter Ray goes to the number one spot. We head to Doc. I check that to Rick. That's right, the former winner, Montoya, brings the car in. Had a little understeer problem earlier in the race, but this time he still had a little slight one, but not enough to make a change. One of the things that Montoya said he was working on was coming in hard and accelerating hard out of the pit stop. He knows every tenth of a second can be gained, and he's hoping that that practice will help out during these pit stops. Well, the timing of this is going to be interesting, because here comes the leaders down the front stretch, and once you get off the apron going into two. We'll see where they match up. So Ryan Hunter Ray leads, but Elio Castroneves is hot on his rear wing, hoping he can kiss the bricks, sip the milk, and climb the fence for a fourth time. The lead trio and the separation back to fourth place as we just crossed halfway in the 98th Indianapolis 500 on a spectacular 79 degree day here in Speedway, Indiana. Show you what's happened so far with our mother's race rundown. Went green a little after noon Eastern time. The field of 33 led to the flag by Ed Carpenter for a second straight year. And the second lap got really itchy for Ryan Briscoe. Very lucky he didn't crash. Briscoe continued in the race, but he is not on the lead lap. He's a lap down. Carpenter and James Hinchcliffe swapped the lead in the early going with Carpenter going out in front. Has been slight. Graham Rahal is out of the race. His car retired. Tony Kanaan spent 17 laps on the pit lane with problems on his machine. Buddy Lazier also has troubles on his car and is on the pit lane and heading back toward Gasoline Alley. Laps led today. 10 different drivers have changed the lead 17 times. Elio Castro Neves has led the most laps 26. Will Power 22. Ed Carpenter 21. James Hinchcliffe 14. Juan Pablo Montoya 8. And the real story of this one is that we've not had a yellow flag yet in the race. Through halfway, a record pace of 211.953 miles an hour through 250 miles. And this first group of three cars about five laps ago had managed to break away from the rest of the field. It seems that Ed Carpenter is getting ready to reel them in. What we have seen throughout the race is that the leader always has to come in earlier for fuel because he's, he's burning through so much fuel. And it seems that the third or fourth place in line is the best to save fuel. And this will make a big difference towards that, that last pit stop. Another thing we've seen throughout this race here today is some really maneuvering by drivers who are a little bit anxious to maybe do a little bit of blocking. We know that Elio Castor Nevis has already had one Warning from race control about blocking as he's now a coming big down run. on Ray, and he's going to get it done. And they work together. Do you see how they work together? Ryan Hunter Ray did not hold his position and force him to take an outside line. And that makes a big difference. If, they, if they're going to keep pulling away, they have to work together. So the new leader is Elio Castroneves, who lives in South Florida. We're racing here in Indianapolis. I tie that all neatly together by reminding you that the Indiana Pacers and the Miami Heat Play game four of the Eastern Conference Finals with the Heat leading the best of seven, two games to one. Coverage on ESPN tomorrow starting at 7.30 with Kia NBA Countdown and then at 8.30. The Eastern Conference Finals powered by Pennzoil Platinum and it's also available for you live on Watch ESPN. Would you like that? Would you like that? I'm an Indiana guy. You know television magic made there? That was very impressive. <laughs> People passing 
going into two. Well, Martin Plowman in the other ABC car, you can see a little hand gesture from Marco Andretti, driving a little bit frustrated. When you get all your passing done in the turns by traffic, it's somewhat difficult to find a nice place to hide on this racetrack, as we've seen drivers before try to be behind Eddie and move offline and find themselves going into the wall. That's his Italian heritage coming out, that hand gesture. I've seen that before in Rome many times. <laughs> you say that it, it, and it's not a friendly one. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> I don't appreciate your driving. Please get out of the way. I have a race to win. Track conditions change. Talked about the journey of the 500 miles. First, let's talk about the mechanical journey, if you will, as the cars run more laps and lay more rubber down on the racetrack and the temperature gets warmer. These drivers and teams have to constantly adjust their machine to optimize it for the sprint to the finish. So that's when they're going to hand out that big trophy. Back to Indianapolis after this from your ABC station, Elio Castroneves is the leader. The 98th running of the Indianapolis 500 on ABC. Brought to you by Chevrolet. Find new roads. A look for at the race for the lead in the Indianapolis 500. Elio Castroneves and Ryan hunter -Ray have put a little gap on third place Marco Andretti as we've run caution free to this point nearly miles into this race. Penske leading, Andretti Autosport running second and third. Now, during that uh, break a moment ago, this really um, interesting moment on the front stretch, riding with willpower. And that's um, Plowman pit lane. Creates all that congestion back there coming Five. off four. Scott Dixon Five. and J.R. Hildebrand. Five. Uh, I think a spotter didn't tell him that somebody was behind because that was a lot tighter than you'd want to be. Oh, right by the wall and the dust comes up because he's so close to the wall. A brave pass by a brave driver. And that's something you don't want to try out home. So as we approach that 300 mile mark, let's go up to speed. Get you updated on some of the stories in the field. We start with the race leader's pit, Jamie. Well, Leo Castroneves enjoying the view out front right now. A lot of people curious about this bright yellow paint scheme. It's called the Yellow Submarine Paint Scheme, made famous by Johnny Rutherford and Rick Mears. Between the two of them, they won here three times with this paint scheme. And Elio, he said, maybe I should be behind, but I'm going to lead as much as I can. Meanwhile, our board pole sitter, the 20 of Ed Carpenter on pit road. Now, the last stop, he had a blister on a tire. You see, they just took off the rear there an issue perhaps we'll get more information but they were watching those tires from Ed Carpenter. Now blisters on the on the back tires means the back of the car is starting to slide around. So unscheduled pit stop there for Ed Carpenter and as Jamie said she'll follow up on that for just a minute. Let's uh, check back down continue going up to speed Doc. Yeah, other leaders are scheduled to come in on about seven or eight laps out level. Let's check on Ryan hunter Ray. What a run for the Floridian who finished third in this race a year ago. He started 19th, and I'm going to be very aggressive at the start. He's in the top 10 by lap 18. Now running in second position, they have made two one-quarter turn wing changes to front, pulled on the bodywork, and now hunter Ray settling in to save fuel. Behind him, his young teammate, Marco Andretti, who's trying to become only the second Andretti ever to win in Indianapolis. Marco had a blistered right rear tire early on. They added rear wing, added front wing to get overall downforce. Marco says, now I know I've got the car. As Hunter Ray takes the lead, Ryan Hunter Ray showing he's got the car too. Marco feeling comfortable. Both those teammates were supposed to be saving fuel. I don't know. Running in fifth is Scott Dixon. Dixon says he knows in the first couple of stints as to whether his car is what he needs. Sure, you're going to tweak it as the race progresses, but having it in the neighborhood from the start is a huge advantage, and that's exactly what the nine team has hit on today. They did make a front wing adjustment on the first stop, but nothing significant since, so they have tweaked on it. Dixon said, I'd want to just hang around the top five and then strike late in the race. He is currently fourth. 
Well, Juan Pablo Montoya right behind. Remember, this is his return to IndyCars. He came back at the beginning of this season. He said, really, it took until the Grand Prix of Indy, which was two weeks ago, before he finally felt at home in the car. Now, one of his goals was to make sure that he's running in the top five when they reach those last three laps. At this point, he's right where he needs to be. Alan? All right, Dr. Rick, so uh, an update on the top five. Hunter Ray really pulled away from Castro Neves, who got separated in some traffic, and also, maybe because he led so many laps, he's trying to nurse the fuel a little bit to get into a window. So Ed Carpenter saw him hitting early. He's dropped all the way back to 21st place. Jamie, got a follow-up? Well, I mentioned the tires that they were watching for. He felt like he had an issue. Well, you saw him pit there, and the tire off the right rear. You can take a good look at it. It's right on board here. In the pits, blisters all over it. So the team just took precautionary action here. They took a pound out of the right rear for this run. So they're keeping an eye on those tires, but perhaps that air pressure adjustment will help. All right, Katie, thanks. And so that uh, that was the sign that uh, Ed Carpenter. That's a bad looking <laughs> tire. Oh, That's yeah. not something you want to see. It was the sign they saw that said, whoa. So we've seen three cars that have, have had problems with uh, vibration and a rear tire. So it looks like the track is changing. And very few cars have managed to actually keep the same pace oh, they have no before, Scott. It's all about managing the car, managing the tires. We talk about the tools that the driver has inside the cockpit. He can feel when the car starts to slide, either understeer means it's pushing in the front, or the back end wants to come around on you to call that oversteer. Work with the tools inside the cockpit to make sure the car stops doing that. You need a perfect balance on the car so you're not abusing the tires on one end, either in the front or the rear. He's flat the whole way around. On the Honda on board right there, you can see the 100% throttle. That means his car is working really well. I like this time the engine is working real well. I'm just watching those speed numbers. Those are what fascinated me. 223 into the corner. Hunter Ray leads. Elio Castro Neves pits. Castro Neves has led the most laps today. Right now he's on the pit lane headed for Jim. Fourth time winner of the Indianapolis 500, Rick Mears, with a call from up above, the spotter for Elio Castaneda. Elio told me he wants nothing more than to go to the three lanes and celebrate with a fellow four-time winner. And today, today, he's led more laps than anybody else. The car has been flawless. And you see him jacked up again. Lots of seconds on that, and they also did a lot of change on the rear wing because the air jack man is making an adjustment to the rear wing at the same time. They followed up a little bit of front wing adjustment. And there's Hunter Ray around the outside. His stop will be coming up here shortly. Back to pit road and dock. Marco Andretti has said no changes, guys. He'll, don't change a thing in spite of the fact that the track temperature is now well over 117 degrees. That'll be Flores waiting on fuel, waiting on fuel, and he's away. Joseph Newgarden is in, Carlos Huerta, Sebastian Saavedra, Justin Wilson was just on and off the pit lane as this next round of pit stops begins. There's Newgarden, Doc. Newgarden on pit road, and uh, the car was sputtering as he came by me. Trying to refire the car, he apparently had run completely out of fuel. The car has not fired. He's sitting there losing valuable time on the screen as they have changed tires, and now they have an issue. Here comes the leader in Ryan Hunter Ray. They talked about making no changes this time thus far, no wing change. They've only wait on fuel. Got to get completely full of fuel so they can uh, maximize their fuel mileage. Hunter Ray away. Circles around his teammate Carlos Munoz, who's on the pit lane. J.R. Hildebrand is on the pit road, and a tire that needs to be claimed by someone is apparently loose on the pit lane. It apparently came from the Munoz car. There's Kurt Busch on and off the pit lane. How thrilling it must be for him, and he can remember coming here as a rookie, coming down here and doing your first pit stops. Scott Dixon in, Vince. Scott Dixon is in. They're going to make a front wing adjustment, which will give him a little bit more freedom with the weight checker that he can control himself within the car. Starting to get to the later stages of the race, and they want to give Dixon more freedom to adjust it with inside the cockpit. Jamie? 
James Hinchcliffe has not been happy today. His car has taken a big swing, understeer to loose. They made that stop when they're just in his front wing to try to help that loose condition and get his car handling better. He worked his way up to fourth, but he had fallen out of the top 10. Hinch had started on the front row for this race. So again, here we go. As we run through another long green flag stint and a full fuel run, Juan Pablo Montoya running deeper, more laps than anybody else. This is going to play into his favor as the race keeps going. And really, if the race were to stay green all the way to the finish, his last stop is going to be shorter than everybody else. That's the advantage that's playing for right now. We're going down half a degree on the real wing. Half a degree on the roof. Juan Pablo Montoya, the race leader, being called to the pit lane. Here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, he'll pit with 68 laps to go. And complete this cycle of pit stops, Montoya has been out there considerably longer than the others in the prior lead group when the cycle began. Here he comes, Rick. Montoya last pitted on lap 99, which basically means he's gone 33 laps between pit stops. And that's not by accident. Early on, the team had said, we need to work on fuel. They're making a rear wing adjustment because they said they want just a little bit more wing in this, a little bit more downforce. Right now, it's a clean stop. And remember, he can work hard to get out of these quickly. It's exactly what he wants to see, but you got to start doing the math. Will it take one stop or one and a half stop to make it to the finish? There you go. That's the whole play right now for Montoya. And usually in races, you can say you can bet on a yellow somewhere between now and the end. But since we have had a yellow free race, uh, maybe all bets are off on that one. So the new leader, Ryan hunter Ray in that yellow car, the two yellow cars, hunter Ray and Elio Castroneves running one and two. Uh, updates, Will Power has just served a pass-through penalty for a pit lane, pit speeding violation on the pit lane. Whoa, almost lost it under braking. So that got power of pass through penalty and then a warning issued to Carlos Munoz's team for a pit safety violation. You saw the tire his own that he hit there sending that out into the traffic lane. Fortunately for them it didn't go all the way across. It shows you the risk that the crew members have when they're working on the cars out there in pit lane. New penalty just called out by race control has just changed oh my goodness. the complexion of the race. Juan Pablo Montoya, pit speeding. Pass through penalty. All that work on saving. Tough because you got to make sure you get back down to the 60 mile an hour pit speed limit. I'm sorry, I got to get the tear off when I press it, press the freaking button afterwards, just to make sure we set our skill. And I did see him struggling. The tear off he's talking about is drivers like to get rid of that tear off, that visor strip on their helmet that gets dirty. As you're coming into pit lane, he just missed pushing the button soon enough to set the pit speed limiter at 60. Caught him for speeding on the entrance to pit lane. The only thing that will get him back in the game is a yellow at this point. So the race leader is the series champion from a couple of years ago, a 33-year-old from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, Ryan Hunter Ray, looking to win at Indianapolis. Two drivers from the Andretti Autosport team leading at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, Marco Andretti swapping the lead with Ryan Hunter Ray before this massive crowd on a spectacular Sunday afternoon here in Indiana. Andretti seeking his first win in a race that has been strange by normal standards here because we've not seen the yellow flag yet. More times than not, we see a yellow flag in the first 15 laps of the race. Here we are at uh, 141 laps, and we've not seen the caution for any reason. What we're seeing right now is a possible preparation for what's gonna happen at the end of, end of this race. If two teammates are together like that, the one that's behind can defend and give the leader just enough of an advantage to make a run for it. So at 350 miles, our Carfax race summary of the day, no cautions, 23 lead changes among 10 different drivers. The most laps led, Elio Castro Neves, who's seen his fourth win. Just two cars are out of the race. Buddy Lazier and Graham Rahal are retired. 
Tony Kanaan and Joseph Newgarden spent long times on the pit road with mechanical problems. They both continued in the race, and there you see some of the drivers that have made big moves on the day, highlighted by the one in the middle, Brian hunter Ray, who started in 19th position and has led 20 laps of this race, currently running in second position. It's sort of a, a cruel legend here at the Speedway. The famed Hall of Fame uh, uh, public address announcer Tom Carnegie bellowing and Andretti slows on the backstretch. Mario Andretti, so strong here, but only won the race one time. Michael Andretti, one of the best ever in open wheel racing. So many wins, every place except here in Indianapolis. And Marco Andretti knows the family history here at the Speedway and wants looking, to change it. He's looking really strong today. We just had so many heartaches there. Um, so many times that we've come up close, really the three of us, um, and so, you know, this year, I really, I don't care if I leave one lap, it just has to be the one that counts. Well, when Mario Andretti won the race in 1969, so many opportunities for this great racing family. But since then, those are some of the things that have happened. More on Marco Andretti from Dr. Jerry Punch. You know, Michael Andretti told me he was six years old when his dad Mario went to Victory Lane. That's a long time ago, 45 years to be exact. And Michael told me before the race started, he said, if Marco wins, it said, I'm gonna embarrass myself in Victory Lane. I will be crying like a baby because it will be so much emotion. But right now, Michael's car that he's engineering, Ryan Hunter Ray is trying to beat his son, Marco. In fact, he just told Ryan Hunter Ray a moment ago, we're gonna have to battle the 25 for the win, so we gotta save fuel. Let's go to map three on fuel right now. The tactical game, how to spend the least amount of time on pit road on that final stop and yet maintain a shot at running to the, to the win. And more important this race than any, because usually yellows give you an opportunity to bunch the field back up have an opportunity to have the service on your car, and then when you come out behind the pace car, everybody is bunched together. But if, if this race goes green all the way, it's gonna become more important. Ed Carpenter in, remember he had to pit shy of the other leaders. We're gonna give you a half a turn of front wing. Earlier, and here he is again, Jamie. And you hear the adjustment there. Of course, we showed his right rear tire was severely blistered after that last stick. So they took one pound out of the right rear. They'll take a good look at it this time and see how it's looking. He said he has quite a bit of understeer. They're gonna adjust for that. They'll put four fresh tires on here. Fred Carpenter, who is maintaining a top five run there. They'll see if they'll have it out to the end. So Carpenter and everyone else are gonna have to make at least one more stop to make the distance. The trick is his will have to be longer. He'll need more fuel if you stay on the green flag. 54 laps to go. We're back after this from your ABC station. I know, it's a yellow. Well, we tried, now we finished it. Now it's advantage Dixon. The yellow flag is waved for the first time in the Indianapolis 500. That's California's Charlie Kimball, who has spun. He spun after he had one almost spin and great save. Now the second time around, you see them uh, extracting himself from the car off of uh, turn number two. This puts Power and Montoya back in play again because everybody's gonna regroup. Top of the screen, you'll see the car come into play. He's just a little high on the line, goes around, gets so lucky because it doesn't really slap the wall too hard. Lucky again that nobody hits him that's coming out of turn two. And now he tries to straighten the car. He lets his foot off the brake a little bit to get control. The momentum brings the back end around still. Been through that many times. You're just sort of riding along as a passenger. Not a whole lot you can do. He was very lucky because in the brake, he had another moment just like that turning into three. So maybe he had an issue with his balance before all that started. And Eddie, you I know that sometimes when you're high in the line like that, you could be right, because maybe he had a loose race car before from what we saw. Sometimes when the car's loose like that, you will not turn the steering wheel very quickly. 
simply because the back end is nervous and you can feel that. This was earlier and you watch him now with the run down here to turn three. Watch him above on the camera here. Outside, on the outside, outside, the outside, outside. That's 14 outside, to Kuma Sato going around the outside and he nice just save. collects it. Eddie, you and I cringe because it's not the way to get away with that at 220 miles an hour. Good look from our Novo Nordisk onboard camera riding with Kimball today. And this is the one that just happened. No. We're going to go on board now, so let's just ride along and listen. Um, smart. Clear. You're clear behind you. Clear. Smart. Backwards. His hands off the wheel <laughs> when he went to hit the wall. That's just to, to avoid some hand and wrist injuries. That's no fun. Safety crew fired up the 83, put the steering wheel back on, and he has driven back around to the pit lane. So Marco Andretti leads. Ryan Hunter Ray runs second. I don't know, man. Cars. I, I've got an advantage right now that I'm not going to say on the radio, but I'm not sure if me being there is being allowed by the. Uh, down for it, or the car isn't that good? Yeah, 10-4. Uh, that makes it tough, doesn't it? Now, he's talking about the advantage he has on his teammate, Marco. <laughs> He's and the not guy, talking he, about the advantage of the guy he has behind. Yeah, and We're looking at talking confident to? guys. Right, and who's he talking to on the radio? Uh, uh, the father <laughs> of the guy who's the yeah. car in front. In front. Yes. yes. Who, who happens to be team? an Andretti. And yeah. the last time they won, I think they put a man on the moon or something <laughs> like that. So even I saw that. So that's the thought of the driver sitting second. How about the thought of the 2008 winner, Scott Dixon, who sits in fourth? You need more down for to pick it up or uh, we can take some out? Um, I think we're going to have to take some out to be racy, Matt. We copy that. So, so what he's saying is he's just not fast enough. Update on Dixon from Vince. Well, and uh, Eddie, you're talking about he's not fast enough, and that's why they've got to take the downforce out, as Dixon just said on the radio, because he knows he's going to have to be faster if he's going to get up there and contend with Ryan hunter Ray and Marco Andretti. They'll look to make that change on this stop. Their pit stops, by the way, have been flawless so far. They've really made up time on pit lane. They really have to be careful as don't take out too much downforce so they can't get up the back of somebody's gearbox in the corner. Marco Andretti had that in the beginning and he had those blistered rear tires. So you've got to get it just right that you can hang on for that final rush. And the pits are open. So Andretti Autosport having a fine day with all five of its cars in the top ten. Kurt Busch in that last run moving up smartly. Uh, being aided a little bit by the fact that uh, Ed Carpenter, J.R. Hildebrand had just made pit stops before the yellow under this green and the penalties to Will Power and Juan Pablo Montoya on those last green flag stops. I would love to know what they've done to Kurt Busch's car change-wise, Scott. Have they given him more downforce to give him some more confidence? Or what are they doing to give him a run at the end? Oh, well, I imagine that's probably the case because he had that mishap the other day, hit the wall. He's the driver now. He's probably looking for security. And now we're going to come up to some more pit stops out. I'd love to know what Kurt's emotions are, that that journey on the day, how nervous he was at the start, when at what point in the race he settled in, and now as the tension begins to build toward the finish, what he and all the other drivers are thinking about and feeling about right now. First thing they're thinking about is a set of pit stops. 48 laps to go will not be the last pit stop on the day, but here they come for a crucial one, Doc. And they have Warren Marco Andretti. You're going to have to go around where Kurt Busch is going to be pitting. And it's going to be a very busy and very congested pit road. You've got to watch your mirrors. Use your pedals. Here comes Marco to a stop. Oh, almost gets hit from behind by his teammate. Marco has asked for a half a turn of front wing adjustment. He will wait on fuel. No problem now with tires are on. And Marco's away. Well, we have some front wing change there for the second pit stop in a row. Four tires have built up with an upper field clean exit out. Ryan Hunter Ray moving up the spot. Scott Dixon as well. Getting closer to the finish at Indy. The 98th running of the Indianapolis 500 on ABC. Brought to you by New Axe Peace Body Washes. Make love, not war.
45 laps to go today at Indianapolis. Next weekend, the Verizon IndyCar Series moves to Belle Isle and the two-mile 14-turn road course there in the waters between mainland Detroit and Canada. Should be a spectacular race. The doubleheader both here on ABC next Saturday and Sunday, both at 3.30 Eastern time. Downstairs, Dr. Jerry Karch. We're with Michael Andretti, and Michael been talking to his driver, Ryan hunter Ray about what's happening strategy-wise. Now he's talking to Ryan hunter Ray one more. Michael, I heard you tell your driver, Ryan hunter Ray, looks like we may be racing the 25 for the win. How difficult is that for you? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's uh, now with this yellow, actually, I think it made it about a three or four or five car race now because you got Dixon and uh, Elio in there. But, uh, you know, it's going to be quite interesting. Hunter Ray said he knows he has an advantage over the 25. You dare to share that with us? Uh, no, I actually didn't hear him say that he had an advantage over the 25, but he just said he thought he had a good car. All right, Michael Andretti. God's got to be tough. He's a strategist here. And he's a dad. The guy he's trying to beat. And he's the team owner, and either way, it's his two cars racing for the win at Indianapolis. That's pretty good. He's a great team owner. To have that many cars up at the front and to be ahead of Ganassi and Penske, that's quite a good day's work. Charlie Kimball's car is being taken back to Gasoline Alley. The only caution of the race thus far, wrapping up here, the yellow bringing a couple of other people back into play. That's Ed Carpenter, who's the leader. Remember, he was off sequence on pit stops because of the blistered tire earlier. Stayed out under the yellow, had just pitted under the green. Now he's out in front. And everybody's going to have to pit at least one more time if they can get 10 laps in. There goes Hunter Ray. They say that the guy that's at the lead on the restart is a sitting duck. Remember, Carpenter did come in before, has some tires on it that have a few more laps on it, but he has run a race lap that's about a mile an hour faster than the people that are around him. So does he have a little bit left that he's not showing at this time? A really important part of the race for, for Dixon right now. He's got to show that he has the speed to stay with this group. He's done a great job saving fuel. He's been on strategy. Now he's got to keep pace with these cars if he's going to stand a shot at passing them at the end. So Hunter Ray, Carpenter, Andretti, Dixon, Castroneves as for the lead. Ed Carpenter goes back through. Now in principle, this lead change could happen to every lap because you could we could tell before that the lead car is almost a sitting duck at the end of the and he's drawing straightaways. Keeping an eye on that fourth place car, Dixon. Remember the report on the pit stop. He's going to take some downforce out of the car because he needed the speed to keep up with these front three. Can he keep up and manage to keep the car underneath him? Taking downforce out of a car. And here he goes again. On a ray back to the front. This leapfrogging can happen every lap from here to the end of the race. And it's fun. For us drivers, we love it. So Ed Carpenter running second. Let's get an update on his car, Jamie. Well, Ed Carpenter last pitted on lap 145. He took a look at the tires. All looked great for him. He asked the team, how are we looking at our downforce? They said, we look good. Let's take a big picture look at this and see how we sit second and how we can lead here. But so far, Ed Carpenter very happy with his car as you see him leapfrogging back and forth with Ryan hunter Ray. Well, we're looking again, and we're going to get it done again into one. Nope. Maybe that's, that's far nope. enough. Now, the drivers are starting to tighten up their game. If you can give somebody a little bit of a problem, make them think twice, you have the mental advantage for this last two laps. But Hunter Ray did there, he gave him room, but not quite as much as before. And as you say, that will just get worse. Here as comes it goes Marco on. Andretti. And he's too late for the peak inside. Now, these passes we're trying to accomplish going into three or into one usually start at the opposite end of the track. So you're coming off of four now. You need to be set up to get the pass completed going into one. He's not close enough this time. But if you're passing somebody at one end of the track, it really got originated down the other end. And another thing we have to say right now is all, all, those, all that talking about saving fuel that we did before, that's all gone out of the window. Right now, they're going as fast as they can, maximum power because they all have to stop for fuel one more time. Everybody does. So a look through 
This lead group of 10, including the rallying James Hinchcliffe, Townsend Bell with a beautiful drive, and now Kurt Busch up into the ninth spot with 39 laps to go. Vince. It's been a rally for Kurt as well today, Alan. He started 12th, fell back to about 20th, and now, as you said, back into the top nine, uh, the top 10 in ninth place. They have added downforce to his car on a couple of different occasions. As you see, the lead change in Carpenter go to the front. Eddie and Scott wondered about how uh, Bush's car has been handled throughout the course of the day. They have added some downforce, but nothing major. Kurt's been very calm on the radio. He's handled it like he's a veteran, not like it's his first time at the Indianapolis 500. And he's right at the end of that leading group. To be in ninth place for a NASCAR driver, having done just one race, is a great accomplishment. You see all the swapping around for the lead, and the fact that the race is finished under caution the last four straight years. It's got a lot of the drivers wondering what's the right position to be in for the finish. As Hunter Ray, one spot, will begin to dive into what they're thinking, where the position themselves, and get ready for what's no doubt going to be an exciting run for the checkered flag. That's all coming up from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, where sculptor Will Barons is going to do some more work in a little while. Big one. Oh, get out of the way. Scott Dixon talked about taking downforce off the car. Would it be unmanageable? There's the answer. The former winner into the wall hard. It is such a fine line between having enough downforce and taking it all out for that final run. Now, I don't know what happened, but I would say there's a, it's a good bet that it was just not enough grip to hang in there. Probably over the edge and almost undrivable. So now this changes it. everything for Ed Carpenter. And there he is already in the middle of the turn, of turn four. The car has already come around from him, so that means one of two things. The car was very loose where the back end wants to come around on you. It had already swapped ends or something broke on the car and then the car swapped around on him. We'll have to get a report from him. He was sideways very, very early on. And nobody seemed to have hit any of those big pieces of debris, which is great. Mm, that's, a, I, that's a very strange spin. In what way? But just way so early. You, it, normally that doesn't happen. He started spinning as he turned into turn four. On board Elio Castro Neves, who was right behind Dixon. See, just the car starts to come around on him right mid turn. Just got really light in the back. That wing, those wing changes are so tricky. You just, it's always a guess as to how much you can take out. And then so often, even, if even a team like Ganassi cannot get it right, it just shows you what a crapshoot that is. And when they make those wing adjustments, what it does, it either puts downforce, more grip into the car, or takes downforce off of it. It makes the car have less grip in the turn. And that's what he called for, Alan, because he felt that he did not have the speed down the straightaway, wanted less wing angle. For those of us who've not driven cars here in Indianapolis, do you have time to be scared? Do you think about it at all when that car snaps around like that? What does it feel like inside the car? That, those two tents that you saw, for him, felt like a quarter of an hour. You feel it loose. You feel it go sideways. You try to correct it. You know you have a long way to go, and you just sit there waiting for that bang. And he, he, was, he had a, a good bang because he went in backwards. The worst ones are the ones where you go in at a 90-degree angle. And let's not forget that safer wall that absorbed a lot of that information, a lot of that energy. And these cars are so great inside the cockpit because the Everybody has actually built the seats to, specific to the driver, as we see, as we understand, Joseph Newgarden's car over there in the grass area. Pit lane is open. The leaders are in. We didn't see what happened in Newgarden. I have no idea what he's doing there. Follow up on that in a minute. This is the race right here. This is where it's going to happen in these pit stops. So busy coming out, sliding in front of the other competitors. was a big, big break for Parker. Got him back on even footing. Even footing, same fuel as everybody else. Didn't lose any time. He was going to have a very hey, save your fuel right long now. Save fuel. Your fuel. Kept going on his run. So 30 laps to go. The crash from Scott Dixon. 
Vince is down in his pit. Mike Scott had just asked on the previous before the previous stop to take some downforce off the car to make it a little more racy. Any impression from you that that contributed to the accident? Well, actually, what happened was he we, we meant to take downforce out of the car, but because it was everybody came in under yellow, we we took out a very small amount. We didn't take out what we wanted would have done on the final stop. Uh, so no, it didn't contribute to that. I don't, we don't think. Had he indicated prior to uh, ill handling with the car before the accident? No, I don't think the car was ill handling at all. You know, it just uh, people need to understand. The viewers need to understand how close to the edge the guys are that in that front pack. You know, you had four people that are broken away from everybody else, and they were they were running fast laps. Uh, and and I think that that's really what's going on. It could have happened to any four of those guys. Any four of those guys. Indeed. Thanks for the time, Mike. Thank you. All right, and we hope to hear from Scott Dixon in a bit. What happened to Joseph Newgarden? We saw Dixon crash. There's Newgarden's car inside the corner. Now Joseph Newgarden seems to be coming out in a normal line. And that looks like Martin Plowman's not slowing down for the accident and gets into the back of Joseph Newgarden. Caution is out. Pit stops made. 29 laps to go. The former winner is done for the day. So as you see the cleanup continuing from turn four where Scott Dixon crashed and Joseph Newgarden's car removed from inside the corner after he was hit and spun around there. Ryan Hunter Ray from Fort Lauderdale in contention to try and score the win today at Indianapolis. Getting ready to go green with 55 miles to go in the Indianapolis 500 mile race. 24 cars on the lead lap. And the intensity is picking up. This restart could be just wild as the drivers scream into turn one, all jockeying for position to be in position for the finish. But they can't give up anything right now. You cannot give up one corner. You can't give up anything. You have to go as if it's the last lap. This is going to be a wild end of the 500. Ryan Hunter Ray from Florida, Ed Carpenter from Indiana, Townsend Bell from California. One, two, and three. Coming back up to speed. Hits Cliff and contact with Carpenter. All behind you here. Yellow's out. You could tell three wide going into one was not going to work. Three wide around here in an Indy car does not work ever. Uh, uh, sorry. Nah, I'm sorry. It was busy down there. I suspect they'll have words with each other. Yeah, three wide, look like. Three wide, stop the bell. We had that in the field. And Hinchcliffe just came from that concussion he had in the inaugural Grand Prix. I don't think anybody's really to blame in that you have to go for these restarts and we could see that every time we restart from here to the end of the race. Well, Ed Carpenter, James Hinchcliffe, and to their outside, Elio Castro Nevis. Check that Townsend Bell and then determine where it went wrong. And amazingly, Townsend Bell made it through. And this is when the spotters will be telling him somebody's oh, high, somebody's outside, high. outside, outside, inside, out. Hang on, bud, hang on. See now with Ed Spotter, I told him that he was on the outside. Last minute, Hinchcliffe came on the inside. But as a driver, you also feel what's going on. Now we ride along with Elio Castro Nevis. You can see all the cars fan out. And to the surprise, there goes Hinchcliffe. Clear. He's a little bit bold. Go high. And Hinchcliffe yeah. makes the right yeah. decision to go to the bottom. But the one who really put the pressure on the two inside cars was Townsend Bell that had just a half a foot advantage to press them down in the lower part of the track. And then they, they touched. And on the onboard look we had from Castro Nevis's car, I believe it was, we actually saw Townsend Bell and Carpenter make the slightest bit of contact before Carpenter and Hinchcliffe bounced off each other. And that forced Carpenter down just enough to connect with Hinchcliffe. 
And, and in one fell swoop, Tauts of Bell, uh, how do you say this? Removed two competitors that were behind him. It was a great move. Both of them right now are just seething when they're spinning. Look at this, little bump, and I'm gonna go around the outside. And that little bump that you feel makes you go towards the inside a bit more, plus a spotter telling him that he's got somebody in the high side, drives into the low side to make that contact with James Hinchcliffe. Jamie, you have more? Well, Eddie, your assessment was very nice, shall we say, compared to Ed Carpenter's radio. Ed said, who was that? His team said it was town, some words about it, very frustrated. Obviously, the two drivers involved, Hinchcliffe and Ed Carpenter, having words, very frustrated. Both felt like they had cars to win this race today, and now their days are done with 23 laps to go. But you really can't blame Townsend Bell for trying that move. Well, the Californian finds himself up to second right now. Did he lose it down low? Nah, they went dove in underneath, made it three wide, just did, and you had position on him. Oh, that was three wide. <laughs> yep, that was three wide. It's a good move. No caution flags through 149 laps today. And now a little rash of yellow fever has broken out. The intensity pick it up as we get closer to the 500 mile mark at Indianapolis. We're back to the Brickyard after this from your ABC station. The 98th running of the Indianapolis 500 on ABC. Brought to you by Expedia. Whatever trip you're imagining, all in one place. Expedia, find yours. Well, we went for a restart with 25 laps to go here in the Indianapolis 500. It did not go green for long. Two cars wound up crashed in turn one. Two cars racing for second place. James Hinchcliffe and Ed Carpenter's machine. Now we're gonna go green with 20 laps to go in the race. And the question becomes, when does the race finish? Because the last four years, the race has ended under yellow. With all the drafting we've seen and the slingshot passing, a big topic on the minds of drivers is when to make your move. When do you want to be leading? You're vulnerable if you're leading, but you lose if you're second and the yellow comes out. And you have to be in the top five. If you're not in the top five, you don't have a chance at the restarts. And here we go again. Hunter Ray got a big jump on everybody. Hunter Ray, Townsend Bell, Castro Nevis, Marco Andretti to Kumasato. The top five, they're three wide for second. Castro Nevis in the middle, Bell low, Andretti outside. Now we'll see if Townsend Bell can withstand the pressure from head for Castro Nevis. Fanning out, everybody desperate to race up into those top four or five spots and be there for the final laps. That's Kurt Busch in the silver machine, challenged by Sebastian Bourdais. Juan Pablo Montoya is just ahead of him. Montoya up to seventh after the speeding penalty on pit road earlier. Now Montoya has had the speed before. Will he be able to actually continue to creep forward to get back in touch with the lead group? And here we go, Castro Nevis, a bull move. Pardon me, excuse me. Townsend Bell, I need to come through. Yeah, but I don't see Townsend Bell just laying down and said, go ahead, I'm gonna help you win your fourth Indy 500. He's gonna attack him again, turning into, eh, maybe not into three, but he's gonna, there, well, you know, he's got his a, own problems a, with uh, Townsend Bell, that was in a block as Munoz went to go to the low side. He looked in his mirror and pushed him down. Now he's on the high side. Munoz, who was qualified second last year, finished second, brave. Now with all this, and Andretti is leading the Indy 500 with only 18 laps to go. Spectacular day for Andretti Autosport. They have cars running first, second, fourth, and seventh in this field. And we've learned in the past that Munoz is not somebody who'll just lay back and wait for the race to come to him. He attacks it and he has no. enough laps right now to get up front and here goes Hunter Ray. He's back in the lead. Yep, that started back in turn two. Remember, we have enough fuel on board to make it right to the end right now. There's no conserving fuel. Your fuel trim knob's gonna be at race. Can he put a gap? Any gap on second place? Probably not. 
The only gap we've got here is the car that's inside here. And here comes Casper Nemes, second. This is the strongest he's been since, the, since probably halfway through the race. And he is going to hunt down Hunter Ray. And just remember, so much of this race being run in the long green flag stretches, save fuel, save fuel. Preach to all of these drivers, forget about it now. All they have to do now is reach down there and tighten up their seatbelts because this is going to be one heck of an end of the Indy 500. So Castro Nevis for Team Penske, looking for that magical fourth win in the Indianapolis 500 to join that club that includes Rick Mears and A.J. Foyt and Al Unser. Can he do it? And there's the captain for the lead. And it is early. We still have 16 laps to go. You think the captain's a little bit excited? 15 times. A winner of the Indianapolis 500, Roger Penske. His driver's out in front. So were the fans. You could hear from inside the booth there when he took the lead. He would be the fourth driver to have won the Indy 500 four times. And Penske would have two drivers in that group. But this race is far from over. Here comes Hunter Ray. Big run. That's not blocking. What he did there, he was he throwing. Now he's forcing Hunter Ray to high, and Hunter Ray goes past him on the outside. Hunter Ray has got a great car. Castro Nevis has got to be careful because Andretti's got a run on him, and he could make a, a run at it, turning into three. I suspect for Elio to take that low line out of three and four, he probably had a problem with the car, had to get off the gas, knew he had to defend going down the front stretch. Hoped he could have got to turn one, still in the lead, it does not work out. Marco right now is Hunter Ray's best buddy. He has to attack Castro Nevis as much as he can. If he forces Castro Nevis to look at his rear mirrors, that will give Hunter Ray just enough breathing room. I talked to Marco and Freddy here during media day on Thursday. He told me about a recurring nightmare that he's had all week long with that scenario we just talked about, the drafting, the caution, ending the race early. He said, I don't know where to be, and I keep having this nightmare over and over and over again that I've got a car that can win the race I want to win more than any other, and I'm in the wrong place at the wrong time at the finish. That nightmare might end, and the Andretti nightmare of not winning Andy might, Andy might win. And they're approaching traffic, which will be complicated for the first five. Oh, talking about a nightmare for Martin Plowman. He knows the position he's in. He looks in the mirror. The spotters who are up in the stands that communicate with the drivers tell him the leaders are coming up behind you, so he's got to find a place to get out of the way. But it's not just one. It's a group of nine. Smartly goes to the low side. And Kurt Busch is in seventh place, right behind Montoya. Oh, he gets out of the way. Very good move. All this pressure that Andretti is putting on Castro Nevis is giving Hunter Ray just enough room that he doesn't have to defend. Top here, the run. Can he make it on the outside? No! Wow! Now he's got to regroup. He can do that move because the guy behind him was far enough back that he knew he could chance that and still not get past. Now he's got to get caught back up if he can get the draft off of Elio, who's just up ahead. And now Munoz, the young Colombian, 22-year-old from Bogota, now living in Miami, begins to lurk, running in fourth. Young driver who last year came to the speedway for the very first time in an Indy car, qualified second, finished second, making moves at veterans like Mr. Cheever and Goodyear in the last laps. We're left wondering how he got away with it. The beauty of being young and brave. You know what I see? I see Ryan Hunter Ray going down the straight. Castro Nevis being able to catch up a little bit. But going through the turns, Hunter Ray's car just gets through there much easier than Castro Nevis's does. It looks like it's easier for him to maintain that speed. Andretti has three cars in the top four. And while you watch that scoring crawl, look at number eight there, Ryan Briscoe. Remember, had the problem in the first lap, so gonna lap down. He's come all the way back into the top ten. What a drive. 
Elliott has to get this time correctly if he wants to lead now, or is he trying to understand and size up where he can make the pass? It looks like his car is better in turns three and four. Ryan Hunter Race is better in one and two. Caution, crash. Oh, yeah, there was oh, the three yeah, in oh. turn two, now a crash. That's Townsend That's Bell. Turn four is hungry today. So just as IndyCar officials called for a debris for caution on the racetrack in turn two, Townsend Bell finds himself with a heavy crash, and the yellow flag is out with just 10 laps to go. Where's the right place to be? That was a great end to his, that was a, unfortunately he had that in, that was a great race he was on. Unbelievable pace. A lot of debris to be picked up out there in the uh, corner. Look at that. So we're going to see him come into frame from the right-hand side as we did. Something goes on with the car, guys. I think mid-turn, Eddie, because that thing is gone. Now, we heard debris. Did he run over the debris? Did the tire get flat? We don't know. At the end of these races, when you have accidents and they try to pick all the debris, it's impossible to get it all. It takes so very little to cut a tire. Well, the debris, I think, possibly, that they talked about might have been ahead of where he had the accident. Yep. Red flag. They're going to stop the race because there's so much debris to clean up in turn two, and they want to give these fans a shot at seeing as much of a green flag shoot out to the finish as they can. Look at all that debris they've got to pick up. Because they could not have cleaned it up in nine laps. I think that's a great decision. The debris was the right front wing plate off of Sebastian Saavedra's car, we believe. Watch those two. Saavedra just gets the left rear tire of Jacques Villeneuve's Dollar General car as they're coming out of the turn, and that's the debris that we were going to go yellow for. And as you watch and ride along with Juan Pablo Montoya just up ahead. Oh, that thing snaps. That's almost like what happened uh, to push the other day. Something went wrong. The back car. comes around. So the field going to be brought down the pit lane and stopped under the red flag to allow the cleanup to continue. And listen to the fans roar with approval at that decision. What a great decision. I'm so glad. We don't know if it's not going to end in a yellow, but I, I think it's glad they have a shot. Well, while they get ready to stop the field here and continue the cleanup, let's back up one caution and check with Vince. Ed Carpenter had one of the fastest cars all day, but got caught in that sandwich going into turn one. What was your perspective of what happened? This guy is not really realizing how much time we had left in the race. You know, it wasn't that wasn't a green white checkered restart situation. Just you know, amateur moves. Did you feel like it was uh, from the outside or from the inside? Well, uh, Townsend and I would have been fine. You know, you know, the the moment when Hinch decided to make it three wide, I think, is when. When it was more than any of us could handle. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you just can't stick it in there. It's just a dumb move. Now they put you both in the back of the emergency vehicle on the way to come here. What was the conversation between the two of you on the ride to the medical center? I'll just say it's a good thing he already had a concussion last week. I was nice. Ed Carpenter. Bitter disappointment for Ed Carpenter, who thought he had a chance to win the race he wants to win more than any other. He did have a chance. He had a very big chance. Down to pit lane and Jamie. Well, nobody knows more about broken hearts and immortality and winning than Roger Penske. Roger, I've been listening to you on the radio and the excitement level every time Elio Castroneves makes a pass. He's sitting second now, less than 10 to go. What position do you want him to be in on that final lap? But it looks like uh, Hunter Ray's got some real good speed, and of course they're weaving on the straightaway, so we got to be careful to try to get down on the inside. But this restart's going to make a huge difference because everybody will be slower. So 
I think you're going to see some real action here, but Elio's certainly in a good spot. He's driven a great race, and uh, we'll just see what happens. Have you already thought, given any thought, to being another four-time winner? Oh, listen, I just uh, think this young guy has done such a job driving for us. Every year he's won these three races, and then, of course, you know, today racing the way he has, it's been tough out there. As you can see, some great cars got taken out. But uh, from my perspective, uh, he's in the right spot to do what he's got to do, and uh, he'll earn his money today, I'm sure. Elio Castroneves, of course, going for his fourth win here at Indianapolis. Doc? And Michael Andretti trying to win for the third time here as a car owner. And Michael, first of all, does Ryan Hunter Ray have what he needs right now in these final laps to hold off uh, Elio and Marco? We'll find out. You know, I, uh, uh, you know, last year we got burned on the yellow. I hope we didn't get burned this time. Where, you know, why didn't he throw the red last year too? So it's a little disappointing because, uh, you know, I think they probably wouldn't have finished and we would have won the race. So it's. Uh, it's going to be interesting now, so we have to just see. Uh, I know it's great for the fans, so that's the main thing. So uh, hopefully we get a good restart and we can hold Elio and uh, be nice to get Marco in there. And, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. All right, Michael Andretti, his car sit first and third. And uh, I think a lot of confidence here that Ryan uh, Hunter Ray has what he needs to be able to get the Indy 500 victory. The field stopped under the red flag to clean up the debris from the crash in turn two, then a blistering sprint to the finish, Castro Neves trying to become a four-time winner. Joining Al A.J. Foyt, Al Unser Sr., and his spotter in turn three for today's race, Rick Mears, also a four-time winner here at Indianapolis. Can Castro Neves overtake Hunter Ray? And Back live at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, Repairs being made to the safer barrier, the steel and foam energy reduction system that is on the inside of the concrete retaining walls around the speedway. One of the great safety innovations in motorsports to help the cushion the, the impact of the blow, and that's left the field under the red flag uh, before these final eight laps of this one play out. Down to pit road, Dr. Jerry Punch. And with Becky Hunter Ray and Becky, I know you've been around racing your whole life, but how difficult is this for you to sit and watch and know that uh, Ryan has a shot here in a few laps to win the Indy 500? It's amazing. He was so close last year and to be up there again this year is just a testament to the driver that he is. Becky Hunter Ray, she knows it could happen, gosh, and she hopes it will. Vince? With James Hinchcliffe was involved in that uh, accident with Ed Carpenter, Hinch Ed pointed the finger at you. How did you see it as you entered one? I mean, I, I was the last guy on the scene, so I guess that's pretty fair. Uh, you know, I, I, from where I was, you know, <laughs> could have been the last restart. It's the last stint for sure. And, uh, you know, you got to go for it. And Ed pulled out. There's a car with there, and I went for it. And Ed gave me the room initially. I, I honestly don't think Townsend knew we were three wide because, again, I haven't seen the replay yet, but. From what I saw, Townsend came down into Ed, who came down into me. But like I said, I, I was the last guy there, so I got to take a portion of the blame for sure. And um, I feel bad for Ed. You know, I, I honestly didn't think Townsend could. I knew he had popped out. I honestly didn't think he was going to try and hold the outside because you just you can't do that here. Uh, for as high as Ed was entering, I knew that Townsend would have been way up in the gray. I thought he was just going to lift, and it was going to be Ed and I in the corner. But uh, you know, obviously that's not how it played out. Townsend kept his foot in it and, and turned into Ed and, and hit me. Partly my fault, maybe partly Townsend's fault, 100% not Ed's fault, and I feel really bad for him. You know, it's uh, he had a great month and was doing a great job. And I mean, I, I'm gutted for the guys because you know we, we weren't great in that sort of middle part of the race, and we fought back, got the car where it needed to be, and uh, feel bad for the Andretti Autosport guys. Thanks, Hench. AB. Two minutes till they fire the engines. Two laps, then they restart the race. Back live at Indianapolis Motor Speedway, you see crew members positioned behind the rear wing of each car. These cars don't carry an onboard starter. The jump starter, if you will, uh, is set and ready to go. In a moment, they're going to fire these engines, send the cars out onto the racetrack. They'll make two laps under the caution to get the field formed and rewarmed up and turn them loose for what's going to be six laps to the scheduled distance. No work was able to be done on the car, so the drivers are going back out with exactly what they were with on the racetrack when they were out there competing before. So no modifications to the car. I can assure you that the driver conversation with the crew when they were sitting there waiting for the repairs to be done to the safer barrier was who's around me, what kind of speech are they capable of, and we're going to find out here in the shootout to the end very shortly who will be the 500. Thank you, Hal.
have to be in the top five in the realistic side. You don't have to have an accident to get past you. Everybody, every time somebody has made a run on another car and they haven't made it, they took their foot off, they'd lose 100 yards. So as the field goes out, remember again, two laps behind the pace car, then they're going to turn them loose and see who wins the Indianapolis 500. Jamie? Adriana Hanau is the girlfriend of Helio Castroneves. You've been back in the bus, and then all of a sudden you made your way out here. What is this moment like? Oh, I'm telling you, I'm going to throw up. I'm ready to throw up. I was telling him, he's like, yeah, don't worry, I'll hold your hair. Like, this is never a that he has so much responsibility, you know what this would mean to win a fourth. Let's go over to Doc. Mario, Marco told me you two had this ongoing debate about where he needs to be in the final laps at Indy. He says he needs to be second, third, or fourth and use the draft. He says you're adamant that he needs to take the lead as soon as possible. What do you say right now? Where does he need to go? I'll say take the lead as soon as possible, if you can, obviously. But uh, he knows what he's doing, and, uh, you know, he'll – give it his all and uh, he'll take everything out of the car whatever the car can give him so we'll just keep our fingers crossed the patriarch of the andretti family mario andretti marco said that mario chastised him for not being more aggressive on the final restart a year ago that's why you finished fourth he said you can't win it back there as soon as they wave the green flag you've got to be the leader we'll see if marco listens now in a moment one lap to go. The signal from the starter stand. We'll go racing with six laps to go. Will the race go all the way to the scheduled distance under green, or will it end short of that? As in the last few years, and with all the drafting and slingshotting, where do you want to be in the last laps? Ryan hunter Ray. Ultimately, if the race is going to go green to the end, you're going to want to pass on that last lap. Probably going into turn three. Maybe coming out of turn four. Could be that exciting. Could be that close. But you're leading the race right now. I think, I think Hunter Ray's in the right place because all those cars that are behind him are going to try to pass, and there could very easily be another yellow. Look at the running order across the top of the screen as we get ready to go. 21 cars on the lead lap. And the interesting thing is that this new generation car, which we're now in the third year, we've not seen this type of a run to the finish here. So the guy that's in the lead, we know, punches a bigger hole in the air, makes it easier for the guys to pass behind. Everybody's questioned where to be. I don't know where to be. I don't think anybody knows where to be, but we're about ready to find out. Estimated better than 200,000 here. They're all standing up. Here they come for the restart to see who wins the Indianapolis 500. Great, 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 great flag. had to hesitate when he couldn't get clear of Castroneves. You heard him with the crick downshift, and he was able to defend his position in line. And he caught right back up to Castroneves. Hunter Ray has a very fast car, which he can hold off going into turn one. And will he defend the position? Scott, here's your answer down low. Castroneves looking for the race lead. And here comes Marco. Two teammates in second and third place. Hunter Ray challenged by Marco and Freddy to turn three. Oh, that's close. That's, uh, that's exactly what that's That's what he wants. Castro Nevis needs the two of them to fight relentlessly to give him just enough room. Now we have four laps to go. The defensive line down the front stretch, but Hunter Ray hooks to the outside. We talked about the wind before. The wind's behind you going into turn three where we're headed right now. We look backwards to Marco Andretti. He's going to try and make a challenge against these two. Hunter Ray almost clips the grass for the lead. He's pulled it off. That was a daredevil move. And Freddy peeks to the inside, but the door is shut for second place. Three to go, three to go. Got 
Nasser Nevis sets up high to get a run for Hunter Ray on the back straight. And if these drivers tangle, Munoz is fourth, Montoya is fifth, Kurt Busch is sixth. Hunter Ray going all the way down to the bottom to try to break the toe. Hello, Casting Nevis does exactly the same thing again, sets up high. Slid there, not sure he has what he needs to get to the front. Big run. Outside. Clear, clear. What a pass. Casper Nevis, the leader. They'll come to the white flag next time. Here comes Andretti. Here comes Hunter Ray. Hunter Ray got him into three the last time. Defensive line by Castro Nevis. He's going to have to do it this time. Here they come to the white flag. We'll enter the final lap of the Indianapolis 500. Ryan Hunter Ray to the outside of Elio Castro Nevis for the race lead. That kind of drafting, warm up the photo finish cameras. Half a lap to go. Ryan Hunter Ray leads. Elio Castro Nevis is second. Can Castro Nevis close on him? He's a couple of car lengths back. One last corner to go. Checker flag is in the air. Here comes Castro Nevis. He won't get there. Florida's Ryan Hunter Ray wins the Indianapolis 500. Captain America pulled it off. Awesome, man. Awesome. like a fun party to be in the middle of, Jamie. Becky Gordon just saying, did this really happen? What does this mean to you and your family? Of course, Robbie Gordon's sister married to Hunter Ray. What does this mean? Oh, my God, when lap 199 came, and I was like, no, 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 you just got to get this. He just won the Indy 500. I can't, I'm like, he deserves it so much. We're just so proud of him and happy for him, and I can't wait to get my little guy down there and drink some milk. Becky. He had one of the most aggressive moves at the race, ducked down low, almost clipped the grass. What was going through your mind? I knew he was going to do whatever it took to win this one, and we just won. Hey, watch out! I'm going to go drink milk. i got to go down there. <laughs> She's going to drink the milk and celebrate, Alan. What a race. What a finish. Oh, my God, Ryan. That is awesome. I can't believe that. I'm so happy for you. Got people crying down here. This is unbelievable. Great job today, man. Started last year's restart first and got shuffled back to third. This year he's going to go kiss the bricks, drink the milk, and have his likeness inscribed on a board water trophy. I admire everybody that wins this race, but it is great to see an American driver having just won the Indy 500. much for Rick to win his fourth as it would for himself.
did not happen today. So much tradition here in Victory Lane, the victory wreath, the Firestone hat, and now the ceremonial swig of milk and the milk bath for his team here in Victory Lane. Here is the 500 Festival Princess to give him a congratulatory kiss. You did it, my friend. You are an Indy 500 champion. Congratulations. What's this like? It's a dream come true, man. I can't even believe it. I don't even know. It hasn't even sunk in yet, but this is just the most fantastic team. I mean, the support they've given me to give me this race car two years in a row to have a shot at winning the greatest race in the world. A dream has come true today, and uh, I'm a proud American boy, that's for sure. Take us through those final laps. The people here on their feet screaming. Got to believe the millions at home watching were screaming. Tell us about holding off and passing and repassing Elio Castaneda. There was no practice for it. We never really ran those lines at all the whole month. and. Uh, and that was all new. Everybody, everything everybody was doing at the end was all new. And uh, I didn't know if we had what it took, but uh, I did my absolute best. And I've got the best team behind me. Nobody can stand on their own without a good team behind them. And these guys did it. And this is number 28, DHL Honda's in victory lane in 8500. And I, I don't even know what to think. Be Becky said last night that uh, you were very confident that this might be your day in spite of starting back in 19th. What made you think as he reached over, there's his young son riding. What made you think, even last night, that this was going to be your day? I knew we had a good race car. We didn't qualify well. We started 19th, but uh, we ran to the front, and uh, I was just biding my time, making the right the right adjustments on the stops. I'm so excited right now, I can't even think. Um, and, and this is just this is just a dream come true. We did everything right today, and that's what it takes to win this race. I've watched this race since I was in diapers, sitting on the floor in front of the TV. My son did it today. He watched me here. I'm just uh, I'm thrilled. This is this is American history. This race. This is American tradition. Our auto industry is based on it, and uh, this is as big as a championship for me. When you look back years from now on what you've accomplished today, they say this is a race that will change your life forever. What do you think you will cherish most about winning the Indianapolis 500? Just being here, having my family here with me, doing it with this bunch. This is my fifth year in Andretti Autosport, doing it with these guys. I have such a great support team here. I mean, they really are behind me every, every, every step of the way. And uh, it was a fantastic fight to the finish. You know why? They went green the whole way, and I love that, because I wouldn't have wanted to win under yellow. I'll win it any way I can, don't get me wrong. but. Winning it under green like that, just a fantastic finish with Elio. We all raced each other clean, but really hard. I think that was some fantastic racing. I hope the fans loved it, because uh, I was on the edge of my seat, that's for sure. Congratulations again to Ryan Hunter Ray.
the 33-year-old out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And there's his buddy Graham Rayall coming in. Michael Andretti over here, the car owner. Oh my gosh, what another celebration for Michael. His third win in the Indy 500 as a car. And for Michael, the five cars he had entered in the race, one crashed, racing for the lead with 25 laps to go. The other four finished in the top six spots. One driven into victory lane by Brian Hunter Ray. And what a scramble those final six laps were between Hunter Ray, Elio Castroneves, and Marco Andretti. And this is all flat out driving. You're not taking your foot off the throttle whatsoever. Running speeds of 223, 224 of which they were doing. You look in the mirror, you see the competitor coming up on the high side. You don't take your foot off it. You wonder if he'll make it or not. He gets it clean. And there we go. The run to the checkered flag. Castroneves just too far back to get there by the time he reached the Art of Bricks. That said, the second closest finish in 500 history, right there. Hunter Ray was unstoppable. Six, 100 to the second between Ryan Hunter Ray and Elio Castroneves. Well, one half of the duo that raced to the checkers has been heard from. Let's check the trick on the other. Elio Castro Neves, you came so close. Let's talk about those last couple laps. Well, certainly uh, they stopped, kind of like break the rhythm, but um, I tell you what, first of all, congrats uh, Andretti Green and, um, and Ryan Hunter Ray. I mean, they were, um, they did an outstanding job. And um, I want to thank Roger and uh, my team, the Shell Penzoil. I think the colors uh, were so close to, uh, to continue the tradition. But I'm so proud of the Shell Penzoil boys. Um, obviously, um, AAA, Hitachi guys, Verizon. Um, I, I want to thank everyone because uh, it was uh, was close. It's a shame, so close. But uh, you know, uh, today uh, uh, it's uh, it's a Ryan Hunter Ray's uh, day. Let's talk about that moment when you came into the pits after the race was over, and you just had to sit and think about it. What was going through your mind? Well. Uh, Obviously, you know, the, flo the blo blood is still flowing. You want to make sure that when you say something, you, you say the right things. And right now, uh, certainly, um, it doesn't take it away, uh, uh, the performance that we had. It's a shame. I want to give this to Roger so bad. Um, I was pushing extremely loud. It was a great fight. I tell you what, guys, I, I, it was a great TV. I was having a great time. You know, it's a, unfortunately, second is, uh, it's, it's good when second sucks, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Elio Castroneves smiling, but he is truly hurting inside. Finishing second today, Castroneves did to Ryan Hunter Ray, who together with his wife Becky formed a charity racing for cancer to help kids who are suffering. Right now he's in victory lane at Indianapolis, helping his son to a little taste of milk. The celebration continues in victory lane at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway for Ryan Hunter Ray, first time winner here at the Brickyard. The Firestone Extra Mile, he had to work hard to overcome the three time winner, Elio Castroneves, the winning pass right here. It's a pity that one of those two great champions had to lose because it was quite a finish. And then able to defend the run from turn four to the checkered flag. Castroneves made the bid to the outside, but too late. And across the yard of bricks was Hunter Ray with victory his. What a day for Andretti Autosport and team owner Michael Andretti, Doc. Indeed, Michael's third win in the Indy 500. Michael, why you were watching that pass a moment ago? You drove these cars. You know how tough that was. What were you thinking when you saw Ryan Hunter Ray squeeze that car and make the pass? Well, I was a little worried when uh, Elio made the pass on him there, right? I think it was like two laps to go, and he was able to get across his bow. And I thought he'd take enough there that Ryan would have to get out of it, but Ryan was able to still stay close. So when I saw that, I'm like, okay, he still has a shot at him. And, uh, and he did exactly what he needed to do. You know, he got him going into one there in the last lap, and, uh, you know, that's what did it. Um, you know, I, I, I knew Ryan was still in a good position at that point, but at that point, he still got to pull it off, and he did. You know, he just he drove a perfect last six laps there in the end after that red. Why is it so special for you, you said a moment ago, to see Ryan Hunter Ray finally get this race as a victory? Uh, Ryan's just been a huge part of our team. You know, he's just a great guy. He's a friend, and... Uh, 
you know, to, to have him get a win here is just awesome. You know, he, uh, he deserves it. Uh, you know, he deserves to have his face on that trophy. And, and uh, you know, we're just so proud to have him on our team. And, uh, you know, uh, if it couldn't have been Marco, he's the next guy I wanted, and I'm really happy for him. Not a bad finish for Andretti all this sport. Congratulations, Marco. Thank you. So proud to have, you know, four guys in the top six. That's a great team effort. How about that for the day for, for Michael Andretti? Alan? A lot of photos to be taken when you win the Indianapolis 500 mile race, but they're all happy ones today for Ryan Hunter Ray. The 98th running of the Indianapolis 500 on ABC brought to you by Royal Purple for the outperformer in you and Progressive comparing rates to help you save. Now that's Progressive. Ryan Hunter Ray wins the Indianapolis 500 for 2014 and as he makes his way from the winner's circle for the traditional convertible ride around the track before all the fans, the driver he fought so hard against for the win comes down for a handshake. And as you look at the top 10 finishers in today's race, four of these drivers had their best ever finishes in the 500, including Hunter Ray, Kurt Busch, what an impressive sixth place run, and the rookie Sage Karam. Ninth place in his first try here at the Brickyard, along with Sebastian Bourdais with his best ever run here. More coming up from Indianapolis after Ryan Hunter Ray's win. All the world's a stage, but some stages, they are bigger than all the other stages in this world. The 98th Indianapolis 500 mile race. Hits Cliff and contact with Carpenter. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. Crash, that's Townsend, Townsend Bell. Immortality, sculpted in silver for eternity. Florida's Ryan Hunter Ray wins the Indianapolis 500. The tour around the track to see the fans after a great 98th running of the Indianapolis 500 mile race. Ryan Hunter Ray will be the 101st face on the Borg Warner Trophy. Sculptor Will Barons will go to work on that shortly, commemorating forever the win by Hunter Ray at the Speedway today. You'll get to celebrate the victory dinner tomorrow night. Then next weekend, it's on to Detroit for two races. You'll see them both here on ABC, Saturday and Sunday at 3.30 Eastern time, the duel in Detroit for the Verizon IndyCar Series. And up next, the world of X Games, surfing from Rio. That's next here on ABC. Speedway historian Donald Davidson says, what happens at the Speedway lives forever. 
It'll forever be known that Ryan Hunter Ray won the 98 Indianapolis 500. All the world's a stage, but some stages, they are bigger than all the other stages in this world. The 98th Indianapolis 500 mile race. Hits Cliff had contact with Carpenter. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. Crash, that's Townsend, Townsend. Bell. Immortality, sculpted in silver for eternity. Florida's Ryan Hunter Ray wins the Indianapolis 500.